I um when does that she wants to make sure we've got the insurance paid on. Good evening, everyone. Uh, That's great. Whatever it is, Tonight we'll be talking about the uh, DPW budgets. Before we move into that subject, um, given that the conversation about the school budget last night came to a relatively quick end, uh, wanted to give uh, each member of the committee, if they wanted to, an opportunity to share some of their thoughts on their vote. Um, just as an opportunity to clarify why they voted the way they did and uh, uh, their support or not support of the budget. So um, for those of you who'd like to do that, Paul, I don't know if you have any comments, if you'd like to start. I, I I enjoyed the, the um, discussion to a point, um, and I think that the uh, school committee has the uh, opportunity to defend their position, as they do every year. If we come up with uh, questions, many times the discussion veers away from dollars and cents and item uh, budget, budget items into more of a philosophical uh, discussion, and I thought that took place last night. I think that's healthy, quite frankly. I don't, have, I don't see any problem with it. I support the budget. I did support the budget. And I, in most cases, I continue to support the budget. However, there are times when I think the public has a right to know how we feel and what are some of the concerns we might have, and the public. And the public was here last night to discuss uh, some of the things that were on their mind, mainly scores, tests. And those are very, very controversial issues. I, for one, have always liked tests to a point, but then found that they can become a hindrance. And, too much focus on it. So, I mean, that's my philosophy on it, and that's the way I continue to approach that budget. And unless something drastic happens in the near future, I'll continue to support the schools. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Sally? Um, I concur with much of what Paul has said. Um, I thought it was valuable that we had a very open discussion about expectations, which I think is really important. And I think legitimate concerns were brought forward. And I respect the people, the town meeting members and members of the public who stood up and said what they were concerned about and um, performance and so on. Wholeheartedly agree with Paul that data is a great tool, but it has its limits. And so I guess we want to figure out how to make the data inform <coughs> what goes on. Uh, but we don't want to be so beholden to it that uh, we're kind of missing the point. Um, I, I, for one, was satisfied by a few of the um, concrete uh, measures that the superintendent and the school committee chair pointed to in this budget. They talked about online tutoring. They talked about a new science curriculum. I know that was an area that um, was brought to light that was troubling. Um, so I, I felt like they heard the concerns. They are aware of them. It's not as though this was brand new information. They uh, had taken some steps to address it in the budget, and that's why I voted for the budget. But I think that that conversation needs to continue. I don't think it should be a one-off where, you know, for five minutes on a jam-packed finance committee agenda with, frankly, too much to my way of thinking, on it for one night. Let's keep that conversation going so that we can try to make some headway. I don't think that the proposal to hold back a million dollars for seven months was, uh, however well intentioned, I didn't feel it was constructive. That's my two cents. Thank you. Gina? I agree with Paul and Sally. Um, I would actually love to give schools more funding to meet every need of every child in the district. Obviously, we can't do that. Uh, but I do think last night I understated the good work that our damaged public schools is doing. Um, I think I agree with Paul and Sally that all, from an outsider's perspective, all we have are test scores sometimes or graduation rates, and that's not enough to wrap our arms around what's really going on. I just came from a school uh, fundraiser. Um, open house at one of the elementary schools and it was phenomenal. My daughter has 
she's a kindergartner and she has tremendous pride in her school. She's doing very, very well. Uh, it's a very, very happy place. We love her teacher. We couldn't be happier and we just finished preschool at a private parochial school and it was hard to decide whether to move and honestly we couldn't be happier with the damaged public schools right now and I've been fortunate enough to participate in two um, community forums uh, with Dr. Dana and I'm really excited about the strategic plan which includes some cutting-edge curriculum around social emotional learning which I don't think the average citizen knows a lot about I hope you don't mind I'm just gonna read one quote from an article I was given at the last session so social and emotional learning involves the processes through which children and adults acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. If those aren't the skills you need to function in the 21st century society, then, then maybe you're not up to speed because I don't think academic test scores show you what you need to be successful in our modern society. Um, we were told that scientific evidence shows that social and emotional learning does lead to higher test scores. Actually, my daughter today was telling me about her social emotional time. It's her favorite time of the day and they're learning mindfulness. Nice. Wow, like, I wish they would have taught me to manage my emotions in school. You know, I got through school on perfectionism and that was a rocky road. Um, so, I wish we could see the results of this strategic plan right now. I, th I think Dr. Dana's team is on the verge of doing great work. I talked to someone today whose children go to Shore Country Day School, and social emotional learning is a big part of their curriculum, and those kids are successful. So I think we have great schools, and um, now that I have children in the schools, I will continue to advocate for our schools and as much funding as we can give them. Thank you. So. Um, I guess my takeaway from the discussion last night was that the goal of most of the people in the audience is to make the schools better. And, and I, I respect the energy and effort that was put forth by people that spoke. I think they raised some concerns, not, not necessarily all of which are fair or valid, but I, I would say there's probably a few that deserve better discussion. And if anybody's watching, I welcome that discussion offline. But specific. You know, to the budget, um, you know, in the data that was handed to us by the gentleman, I see that you know our school salaries are right in the middle of the nine of the nine districts that he, he ranked. Um, and I actually did a fair amount of looking today at how spending correlates, for lack of a of, of a easier metric to get my hands on to, to SAT scores in in, that, in districts in Massachusetts, We're right in the middle. And if we want to have a productive discussion about improving the performance of our schools and maybe punching above our weight rather than punching our weight. I don't think that kind of, I dare I say arbitrarily holding back a million dollars is the right way to go about it. Like, um, and frankly, so that, uh, frankly that's why I voted to support the budget. I think it's, it's reasonable given the constraints we have, contractual constraints and everything else. Um, and we should, you know, it, it's you know, never wise to fight a two-front war. We're trying to improve the schools. We want, we want the faculty and, and people working with us and, and don't want to, I don't think we should be using um, the budget as necessarily as a stick to achieve those goals. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. Mike? Education is what you get when you read the fine print. Experience is what you get when you don't read the fine print. Bottom line is we're uh, appropriating $42,317,000 plus for our school system is doing very well, but occasionally they need to be criticized because it shows that it's been a steady decline for over 10 years on scores. Now everybody says we don't have to have worry about just scores, which is fine, except that uh, most of the colleges still want to see what your grades are when you go in. So I'm not against them. It's basically, I hope you can improve 
and help the kids along because that's what it's all about anyway. Thanks, Mike. Mike? So I, I, I definitely want to applaud Andrea for the effort that she's put in, and I really appreciate the fact that she has been very public about it, that she certainly provided us with the materials that she, that she had for us beforehand. I think that was really good because we were able to take a look at that before. Um, I know she talked to the chair. And, and, I, and I think that, that she absolutely loves the school, and I think we, we should certainly pay attention, and I think we did with that. In regards to the $1 million holdback, I, just, I really feel it's important for us to understand something about that. In order to do that, we would have to, as a town meeting, appropriate a million dollars less. This business of holding it back is just, it's both statutorily and, and, and practically imp, imp, uh, imp, impossible to do. So what would happen is, is that the school would be appropriated with a million dollars less. The school, like every other budget in our town, is required to balance budget. And so the school would therefore have to cut a million dollars from their budget the next day after town meeting appropriated one million dollars less. It's that simple. We don't have a lot of discretionary <clears throat> budget room in any of our budgets, and the school department is no different than that. In fact, somewhere in, in, in north of 90-something percent is tied up in, in, in wage and benefits. So if we were going to have to cut that million dollars, that million dollars would either have to come from discretionary programs, which are very few. That's basically co-curricular and, and extracurricular activities. It's basically equipment and, and, and maybe some minor repair stuff and, and supplies. Or we would have to cut teachers. It's that simple. And there's no other way around it. Now, taking what was said by, by Dr. Billings, if we, if we believe that our schools are not run properly and they're not run well, I don't buy that, but on, this, on the face for argument, let's say that, it, that they do, that that is the case. Does it make any sense to take this group of people who we don't think does a very good job and give them a million dollars less <coughs> and say, oh, this is definitely going to improve outputs? Of course not. So that idea should be a non-starter for anybody in town meeting because, again, it's impractical. It's probably illegal in terms of this idea of this holdback. And it's going to put a tremendous amount of, of pressure and some catastrophic pressure on the school department in order trying to, to try to deal with those things. So I would definitely say that we should not do that. I also think it's important, and I will reiterate this again, if people in town believe that the schools are not doing what they should do, get involved with the schools. Run for school committee. Get involved with the, with the various um, programs and, and committees that are formed with the school committee. They are an independent group. They have authority over the school budget. Even if we did cut a million dollars, and I talked to somebody today about it, let's say, as an example, we picked out line items in their budget and said, we don't think they need these things. We think we can get rid of these four positions, and that's going to save $400,000. And we cut their budget by $400,000, we meaning the town meeting did. The school committee is under no obligation to not fill those positions. The school committee simply will operate on the budget, which is $400,000 less, and they may cut those positions. Well, they may not. It's their purview. That's the reality of the statute in terms of how our schools run. So again, I think if people really are interested in changing the schools, get involved with the schools, and, and, and take advantage of those opportunities. Thanks, Mike. Sally? Thank you. Um, well, I, I think both um, Mrs. Daly and uh, Dr. Billings did a lot of work to present the information that they wanted to present last night. Um, and I appreciate, I appreciate that. I appreciate anybody who cares enough about their town, they're going to take time on their own time to pull together information and try to do an analysis. Um, I think the school committee is, as you mentioned, I think, Sally, it's not the first time they heard those things. And if it is, then surely last night they heard that there's this question out there in the town 
it's hard for me to know how widespread it is or not, that people are wondering about how the schools are doing and how do we know how the schools are doing and so on. And so I think it, it, it would be, and they probably already have this in mind, um, who am I to tell the school committee what to do, but it would make sense for them to take that to heart and find ways to um, sell themselves and to show, to, to show uh, how they're doing and what they're doing and reassure the community as a whole. I agree very much with what Mike said that if anybody has concerns about the school system, they should get involved with the school system. As Gina has said, being involved as a brand new family in the school system, already she has gained such insight into how things are going. And I, I think that's one of the joys of, of being a citizen is to be able to say, you know what, I'm interested in this thing happening in my town. How do I get involved? And there's lots of ways to get involved. Um, I think there are lots of metrics. There's lots of ways to measure how we're doing, how the schools are doing, how the kids are doing, and all that. I, I think it's important to track. It's important to know. I do think that there would be some real legal issues with trying to hold back part of a budget to try to set up this kind of escrow or something. I don't think the statutes allow for it. I haven't spent a lot of time looking at it yet. But as Mike says, as a finance committee and as a town, we uh, vote for the bottom line of the school department budget. They have the prerogative and the discretion and the authority to spend that money in the way they see fit. They give us their budget every year to help us understand how they get to their number. But in fact, we don't have control over how many teachers they have, or how many administrators they have, or how many books they buy. So we have our authority as a finance committee, as a town meeting, I don't think we have that type of authority to, but to vote a number but hold some of it back. Um, but the fact that people are raising these issues is significant and important and needs to be uh, attended to and addressed. So I, I appreciate all the input that people had and I hope that their concerns will be allayed um, quickly. Thanks, Kelly. John, you weren't part of the discussion. I wasn't here night. yesterday, but um, it's very interesting. Just listen to what you've been t talking about right now. It's very, very interesting. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the DPW for indulging us for a few minutes, and uh, at this point, we'll turn it over to you, Dave. Absolutely. Thank you. Sounds like we missed quite a night last night. We'll what we're hoping tonight is a little faster. Yeah, hopefully a little more boring. We'll sit back, a quiet, relaxing night tonight. Well, the we'll problem was, fast. you guys, the, the people took too long on their presentations, so that was what took all the time. Rodney has me on a 30-minute time <laughs> clock over there, so it's like, if you hear any dings going off, it's because Rodney's got us on the clock. So. Um, hold on, I gotta figure out how this works here. Good. Thank you, folks. We're um, pleased to be here uh, tonight before you. Obviously, I need to introduce the team. Right to my right, we have our business manager, Peter Kapusik. Everyone remembers. To my left, our DPW director of operations, Brett Gonzales, who handles the DPW uh, divisions. Directly behind me, Mr. Stephen King, our town engineer. And next to him, our newest member of the team, Mr. Clint Allen who is our new assistant utility director on the electric division, um, a position that we've been working to create for a long time, and we were able to promote Clint from within. He was, he's been on the engineering side and the power supply and the energy efficiency side for us. And he's able to move <coughs> up into this role, and he's hit the ground running, um, helping us even wind up at the end, of the end of this budget presentation putting things together. So we're glad to have uh, Clint as part of the senior management, uh, management team in DPW. On the tax-supported DPW side, we did want to have a slide just to highlight a few things in 2019 which we felt were particularly important. Once again, we still need to remember that paving is important to Danvers, and we like keeping the roads in good shape. Quite a list of roads um, that we did pave last year. Uh, Locust Street, Pine Street had to do it. That's the second time we've done Pine Street since I've been here, so I guess I've been here too long. But on the, the second bullet, the sidewalk improvements, I uh, hope the board knows with this budget, we had to do major sidewalk work on Kimberly Drive, Watson Parkway, Charter Street. This is in addition to small sidewalk repairs, which we're doing all over town. So as our trees mature around town, the trees are causing havoc with the sidewalks, and sidewalks are becoming more and more of a big percentage of our repair program. So we're repairing roads and sidewalks every year, and we see that continuing. 
a large portion of our budget money going towards sidewalks. On the building side, uh, our buildings division, we're able to do some renovations for our new finance director, the retirement offices here in Town Hall. That went well. And our three roofing projects, which was the Central Fire, the Senior Center, and 7 Canal Street, all were budgeted, all came in on time under budget. We're very pleased that they all seamlessly went with everyone still in the building and kept operations going. So very pleased with those projects. For 2020, I can't tell how excited we are to get working on Smith School, the designs. It seems like the community, and of course we are excited about the, the new design uh, for Smith School and to start that this spring. The Highland School Roof Project, we're getting ready to get that out to bid before town meeting. I'm not sure if the board's aware, but that project, uh, once we submitted to, M to MSBA for part of their accelerated program, the architects came, really dug into that building, tore the old roof apart, looked in, and there is more work to do on Highland School than we expected. So um, we're still going to be under the appropriation, however, what we thought um, was going to be a, a $1.6 million project is likely to be more of a $2.5 million to $3 million project. And that's what, for example, one of the old roofs was left on there when they did the renovation. We need to get in and tear that back. We need to get in and repair structure that wasn't done as the renovation. So as part of the Warren articles, we'll be giving you folks a new um, Warren article request, some language, and talk more about the Highland School roof reconstruction, really doing that roof all over once and for all or for the next 25 years. Um, hazardous waste cleanup, the gentleman sitting right behind us, Mr. King, has led the efforts down on Purchase and Ash and soon will be leading the efforts on Clinton Ave. And I can't say how we're very pleased to get that money from EPA to help clean up these sites in Danvers. And Stephen King's, his involvement to create that bridge between the residents and the EPA has been invaluable. They just, APL comes into town and Stephen's right there protecting the rights of the residents, keeping them informed, and it's made it for a very successful project on Purchase and Ash, and we hope that'll continue on Clinton. The Clinton Ave project will start with the small cleanup behind the condominiums on Water Street, and then it'll go later on, we'll go across the river off of, you know, on the end of Clinton Ave there, that site. Last, it may seem small to you folks, we've been working for a few years on our, the fleet maintenance software, getting us off paper and pads of paper in the, in the garage, and we're finally there. We have, we're just, we've got the um, software in place. We're trying it out with one mechanic on a tablet, able to put work orders in, track what we have, and we're excited to roll that all out and have a fully functioning uh, fleet maintenance software program in 2020. For myself, it's been long overdue. Overall, the tax-supported DPW budget is up 1.92%. Uh, which we we're pleased about. That's we're shooting to try to get it in as low as possible. The next slide has the a few of the next two slides have the a few of the major items that we wanted to talk about. We do have one position which we've restored to DPW. Well, we're, Rick Rogers retired. We had Rick on as a part-time basis. He assisted Stephen and his staff. Now we're working towards um, weaning away from Rick. We still have some money in part-time salaries for a, a few hours for Rick. However, we need to get the engineering division back up to full speed. So this would be for a, um, an entry-level civil engineer position that would work under Stephen, and it would be funded 50% from tax-supported budget, 25% from the water budget, and 25% from the sewer budget. And that's after us meeting as a team, that's how we believe the person will work, uh, the duties that will be assigned to this person. Um, uh, we believe this is important and it'll pay off and avoid the need to hire consultants to do a lot of this work. Other than the civil engineering position restoring that, we have the 2% salary increase across our budgets and normal step raises that are contractually obligated to. On the other expense, um, Peter and, and Brett have really looked at those numbers in the five-year average on electricity and based on the averages, and there's a modest re there's a slight decrease in the rate from last year. However, that's very close. It's mostly on our consumption. We're able to conserve, conserve more, and we see a, a nice $55,000 drop in our electric, electricity budget. Oil is going up 23000 based on a, little, a rate increase we project and slightly higher average usage, even though we're trying to get away from oil on as many of our buildings as possible. 
there's still a few places we need to use oil. Gas on the other side is going down. That's great. Our buildings are more efficient on the natural gas where they use that, and we're able to lower that budget. Security system for all of our town buildings. This is something that um, we're looking to revise how we do things. Uh, this is that we need to hire a company that monitors our security system. Under the state bid laws, we have to bid this every two years, which means a company has to come in and change equipment and do things to make it fit whoever's the low bidder. Um, we do need to ask for an increase on this budget, an extra $12,000 to change equipment down, get the outdated equipment all out. And we're also looking perhaps next year to come back and try to, instead of doing a, a three-year bid, to get town meeting to authorize us to do a 10-year bid. So we have one company doing this, and that would level off the cost so we don't have these increases every three years like we're seeing right now. Refuse collection, you'll see that's up 19000 that's our 3% increase that comes in every other year with both that contract and the recycling collection. For both refuse and recycling collection, we're in year seven of a 10-year contract. So we're good for three more years. And from talking to other municipalities, we're getting a great deal right now. So we want to hang tight. Of course, we'll go back and ask for another extension of that contract, but I believe we'll be turned down and likely in three years have to rebid that. So it'll be a lot of tough decisions to make in three years from now. Snow removal equipment, this is up 5.5%, 22,000. We did have to do an increase. These are the snow removal equipments, the, the pieces of uh, equipment that we hire and pay per hour for each snowstorm. We had to increase our hourly rate this year to be competitive with the other towns. We're still on the low end. Uh, so we're concerned even going into next year. So even with a $22,000 increase, it's going to be tight uh, how we could do that based on our five-year average usage. So all of our snow removal costs are based on five-year average. That's the salt, the overtime, the equipment. That's what we do. And it's trending up right now. Um, this year, so far, so good. We've had, you know, we're right now we're under budget. We have $322,000 we haven't spent this year. First time in quite a few years we've been under right now. Uh, we did have to go out 14 times. So it was like the year of going out for very small snowstorms. We plowed or salted two inches of snow more times this year than I can remember in a long time. Those storms that just require treatment, but yet it's not a six to 12 inch snowstorm. We only had a couple of those. <clears throat> hazardous waste removal is down. This is the removal of our uh, stuff from our fleet garage that's hazardous waste, the hazardous waste day based on average tonnages and the, based on the current costs of what it costs to get to remove things. Landfill consultant. This is one that I always get sized when we talk to the selectmen. We have a landfill. It's going to be around forever. We need to maintain that within compliance. We have a flare system, which burns off the, um, the methane gas. We have to maintain that system. So we're finding that we need to have people come in to work on the flare system. We have to do testing, to, and we need this money in addition to what's in the budget already, a 21% increase, in order to meet regulatory compliance, just to keep our landfill in compliance. Inspectional services, this does everything from our inspecting our uh, fire extinguishers to our elevators to all of that, of those items. Uh, the biggest causes increase is for inspecting grease traps. We need to go around to our buildings to inspect the grease traps to make sure they're operating and staying in compliance, and we're seeing increases in the other inspections that I've previously mentioned. Software costs, uh, we're seeing a 52% increase. There's a number of things that are causing this. So now software, this is the annual maintenance, maintenance and licenses with the software. So now we have computerized work order systems. We have our buildings, which are in the school dude solutions, so we can schedule our building usage on the computers. We have our fleet maintenance uh, software in addition to our mapping software. All of that is incorporated in, in this. This is separate from our billing software. In water and sewer, we'll talk about software upgrades, and that's for our billing. Our new changing our online billing program is our biggest thing on water and sewer for this year. Uh, travel allowance, this is, we have the director of operations and a few other folks that's new to the budget that where they get travel allowances. They do that instead of having a town vehicle. Uh, conference fees, an adjustment based on who's going to a conference this year is a decrease in that line item. 
and dues and memberships. Uh, so we have a 26%. This is the uh, members of our, our department that belong to professional associations. I do that. Brett, anything on that membership that you wanted to add? As far as? The dues and memberships? <clears throat> well, it's so it's essentially any of the uh, affiliates of our public works, um, anything for like water memberships and all that are all included in that for New England Water Works Association and all our professional memberships that we continually go to to keep on top of the current trends of what's out there in, in, uh, uh, in the industry. Sure. So, Mr. Chairman, at that point, at this point, I could take questions on the um, personality and the other expense of the DPW budget before we get to capital. Sure. If you'd like. John? Um, I think pretty much you've talked pretty much about what we're going to do, what's going to be done. Um, snow, snow is mentioned in here. Um, 1.9 at the end. Um, I think I'm all set. Sally? Thank you. Um, you were talking a minute ago about software. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in, in fiscal 2017, it was just over 7,000. Fiscal 18 was under five. <coughs> and now it's up to 33 in this, current, in this proposed budget. Um, that just it just is such a huge progression over a fairly short period of time. Do you think this is something that's like we're acquiring this software and then it's going to float back down to the prior levels, or is this something that we should expect being at this <coughs> higher level going forward? It seems we've passed the hurdle. We have all the systems in place now. If the, if the fleet system, the school system, those are in place, now it appears this funding level is something that would remain stable. The license. This would be the licensing fees and the, the annual upgrade fees. So this thirty-three thousand dollar will probably. I mean, I, I understand it'll fluctuate, but you're, you're expecting it to be up at this level as opposed to the four or five thousand dollars it was in. Correct. Yep. Um, the there are just two other things I was wondering about. Plow repairs. You show a twenty percent increase, and winter chemicals is is also an increase. So winter chemicals, the increase there is based on the five-year average, based on how much we're putting that out. The unit price of the chemicals that we're putting out is very similar. We don't see a major increase there. On the plow repairs, that was, they took a look at the condition of the equipment, what they had to do to the sanders and repair those. We are keeping sanders on longer than we expected. We've doubled the lifespan of them. So we are putting work into those, and that's the sanders and the repairs to the dump truck bodies are the major portions here that are driving that cost. The, um, with, with the winter chemicals, I mean, there's always a concern about the impact they'll have generally on our environment. Uh, what, can you describe it all, what, what the chemicals are and the safety of them? Sure. We, we use, obviously, we use, we use salt. And right now, the other chemical we use is magnesium chloride that treats the salt. We used to use calcium chloride, and we found that the magnesium chloride is more environmentally friendly that we treat the salt with for very cold temperatures. The salt, our biggest thing with the salt is to minimize how much we put out. So the trucks are all calibrated to make sure they don't put out any more per lane, we, we call it tons per lane mile, how much they're actually, how much, how many pounds every, every foot they go, how much they're putting out. So the trucks are calibrated and the employees are instructed where to keep those settings, the trucks are all programmed with the speed of the truck. That's the biggest thing, not to put out any extra salt just only what's needed. And we, we know, based on the temperature, how much to put out. We can calculate that. The other thing that we're looking at, the product, is using a, a wetted salt, more of a liquid brine solution on the roads. We're investigating that to see if that could be a more environmentally friendly option to treat our roads. Where we'd go out, put a one brine surface on the road, and that would maybe take the place of two salt treatments and be more environmentally friendly. Well, that's what we're investigating right now for the future. Would you need to change the vehicles, though, that you, that you use to, to spread it? or to uh, we've, we've gone and visited other towns that have modified some trucks similar to ours. We'd have to buy some mixing, some equipment that would go at the main base station, and then we'd have to, we could modify some of our trucks. And in the future, we may be able to look at a truck that just did that brine solution. So that could be in the future, having a, a designated truck instead of a regular sander, a brine truck that puts out a liquid. Okay. Thank you. 
I always want to thank you guys. I don't know if it's Peter or who it is, but realizes it's sort of the trick that we look at these and we see what items have big increases and big changes, and that's the questions we ask. And I appreciate the fact that you show that to us from the get-go. So okay. I really don't have, because you've covered most of those things. I don't have any questions. Thank you, Peter. Mike? You hit most of mine, except, uh, let's see, 52420 security maintenance. Yeah, that was that. Um, that's that's the one, the big, the, the security of the town buildings that I talked about, that we've got to revamp the equipment. All this. You're putting cameras up or something? Well, not cameras, just the, the dialers, the, that, the, the alarm sensors and the dialers that actually call the security company, those need to be upgraded. Okay. And just one other quick question. Uh, what's the status of the building on 7 Canal Street? So 7 Canal Street, we have bids going out on the street right now to do the same project that we had out to bid a year ago. Um, so right now, we're expecting the bids to come in slightly higher than last year due to escalation. We haven't changed the design. We're bidding the same exact thing. There's a chance it may not come in. However, we're planning for escalation. And so in anticipation of having price escalation, we've got a warrant on town meeting to add any money to the existing budget if the price goes over what it was last year. And we have a, uh, we know how much we can afford out of water retained earnings to add to last year's budget to do that project. Expecting the bids to come in shortly. Yeah, so the bids, we want the bids to come in. It's all timing. So the bids would come in just prior to town meeting so that we could act, we could act at town meeting to add any necessary money to the budget. But once we open bids, we have 30 days before we can award it. So town meeting would be smack dab in the middle of that 30-day window. That's how we have it signed laid out right now. Thank you, David. Yep. Ted. Um, so the three roofing projects you guys did last year, was that with, with your team or was that contracted out? So, contracted? no, no, it was contracted out. Okay. We managed the projects. Okay. Yep. And will you be coming back to us when we have to talk about the Warren article? Yeah, we're going to come back. I think it's a week after next to talk about all the Warren articles in well, detail. I'll table, I'll table the, the roof for now. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the security, it sounds like you guys are changing out equipment that's still in its useful life because of the bidding rules. Is that what you're getting at? No, I've been told the equipment is at the end of its useful okay. life. So there wouldn't be any, like, the switching costs. So, so the benefit of going to a 10-year contract is locking in just the rate from the security supplier as opposed to avoiding the switching costs and the bidding costs? I can lock in his rate, and I can lock in he would have to maintain equipment and keep it going for the 10 years. Okay. Um, Today. Sorry. That was really it. Thank you. Gina? Um, just a question on the, the, the landfill consultant. It's yeah. doubled in three years, and it's almost a full person salary. Why is it so expensive? Um, how often do they come out? I'm just, can you just explain briefly a little bit more how that works? Sure. So the entire landfill monitor consultant budget is $85,000. That's the whole budget. So $50,000 of that is for the monitoring, to pay someone to go out there, test all the sites, compile those test results, and put it to the DEP, and, um, and do our, our regular, <laughs> our annual report. $15,000 is to maintain and repair the flare, that flare stage. That's what we're spending right now, $15,000. $20,000 of that is regulatory compliance support. That's having someone come in to analyze if we have a broken well, if we have a sample that's out of whack, anything to deal with the DEP with us. So the $20,000 our um, spending of that has been anywhere from ten to like $22,000 in past years. If we don't get any samples out of, that are out of um, out of normal range, then we're less than 20000 that. So there's a slight buffer there. However, on average, we're spending $20,000 on regulatory compliance support, we call it. Okay, so you're budgeting the max amount in case of... In case, just okay. to, yeah, we have like that little, bu that little buffer right there. Yep. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, thank you. Um, I love DPW matters because it's really where the rubber meets the... <laughs> road or the we do too. As he, um, so I want to thank you because I call quite frequently with recycling or rubbish barrel 
complaints and Lee is always right. really nice and really helpful and I am that person who has driven behind the recycling truck because I didn't leave something out. And oh, yeah. So my questions are, um, we're in the seventh year of a 10-year contract. I know the market has changed for recycling and I know that China has closed its doors. I'm wondering, do you see either within this contract or beyond it a day when we can have those big, enormous, beautiful toters that are indestructible and everything goes in them for single stream? Is that in the cards? I so, know that. Yeah, so present, I've met with our, our haulers twice. I've done two negotiation sessions with our haulers to see how we could get a price to go to the single stream, especially knowing that when the truck breaks down, they send a single stream truck and they're mixing it all together. And so, it kills me. Right. Uh, right. Okay. And so um, we couldn't get, we were looking at a 50% increase in our recycling budget to get them to do single stream recycling in town. And we have the cost of those large, large toters. We'd have that cost. So under the current contract, in talking to the manager and the board of selectmen, Right now, it's, it's cost prohibitive for us to change to single stream. It just gets too expensive. We can't afford it. In fact, you know, could yeah. I chime in to say, too, that you mentioned China, and I think I would note that um, I'm on the board of directors this year with the Mass Municipal Association. This is a topic that's on our monthly agenda because there are, I mean, at our last meeting, Taunton was commenting that. But we're very fortunate we have three years left. Our, our hauler would get out from underneath the Danvers contract tomorrow if we gave them the opportunity. New report, I think, was facing a 40% increase yep. in their negotiations. Okay. Taunton is about ready to abandon recycling because the tipping fee for recycling is about to surpass trash hauling. Yes. Yeah, we have that. towns out west in the same boat. So it's a, yep. it's a global issue. Yep. It has the attention of the, uh, the executive branch um, and certainly the DEP. Um, so we, I think we're in a position where we're going to put our weight behind looking for or supporting whatever that solution looks like, knowing we have three years. Yeah. We're hoping it happens in the next three years or we'll also be in a position where we're stuck um, because the, the China with deciding not to take that recycling has had massive impacts on uh, states and major cities and regions. So. It, and we should note that the single stream recycling causes more waste. There's more contamination, there's more, there's more items that can't be recycled. And oh. thus, that's why they've lost revenue on that part. All right. Well, that's actually encouraging. Um, so do we have, I know some communities have curbside composting. I don't think that there would be a huge demand for it. But is there a composting area up at the landfill where anyone can drive and bring their composting and try to reduce? We have to stop putting as much stuff into landfills so I'm just thinking yeah can we I, find so unfortunately we don't own enough land up there to have any kind of composting even our leaf composting is done outside of Danvers we rent or lease with a company to do our leaf composting so all the leaves that we collect on the side of the road those are all taken to a, a site outside of Danvers where they're composted and turned into loam just because we don't have any room uh, don't have space for it so as far as if we looked at food waste composting, in addition, we definitely don't have the acreage, the space to do that in Danvers, uh, never mind for the cost that we're aware of. The right. So we'd have to connect like with Brick Ends Farm or one of those entities, right? right. And, and say, can we have an arrangement? So when we've looked at it in the past, and there's a few people in Danvers that have called Brick Ends and they have private deals with Brick Ends. I and, saw someone on Pine Street. Yeah, and, and so we have, through our recycling coordinator, Gail Bernard, she provides any resident that asks the link to get them to do that, and we encourage it. Um, okay. For, for the town, we, we'd want to, if we were going to get into it as far as a town-wide thing, number one, it would cost something. We'd have to think about the costs. Mm -hmm. And number two, we want to make sure whoever we're dealing with can sustain it. We don't want to start a program and then all of a sudden, a year and a half down the road, the, they can't afford it or they have problems with the markets and such. We haven't seen that yet. Brick, Brick Irons is doing well, but however, at a large municipal scale, we're not sure if they're ready for that yet. So we're going to keep looking at those to see, you know, when is the time Danvers should get into a whole food waste thing and what would the cost be of it. We're going to monitor that, but we're not ready for it yet, we don't believe. 
Okay. All right. Um, last question. Uh, the fertilizing program. Um, it's not a lot of money, but what are the chemicals? Oh, there's a, a, vari a variety of chemicals. So this is on our, our athletic fields. Mm -hmm. So it's, we have um, the organic things that treat the, treat the grubs. Then there is some phosphorus fertilizer that has to go on. Um, and it's a it's a blend. I'd have to get you the exact blend. Do you have that breath? It the won't exact, mean. I, don't have I mean, the exact blend it's not utilize. like I'm. Yeah. So, we, so it's heavy. a it's I mean, an athletic field blend of fertilizing that, that we do have to put on in order to get the grow, gra the proper growth in the, from those athletic fields. All right. I'm just planting the seed. Oh yeah. As it were. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm good. Thank you. Oh wait, one last one. Excuse me. Another pun or no? no it's not a pun. <laughs> 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 uh, is all of the snow plowing done privately, no. or is it a combo? So when we go out to treat the roads with the sanders, that's all of our crew. When we go out plowing, we put out 30 town vehicles and 60 hired vehicles, approximately. Okay, and if someone were to have an issue with restoration after plowing, they would. Contact. Call Hobart Street. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank we have you. a list. We have a list of broken curbs or uh, other you know roads <laughs> that we blocked up. We have a whole list we're fixing right now. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's not so. Ninety vehicles on how many miles of road? Just no, two hundred lane yeah. miles. Hundred miles of road. Okay. Any citizen comments? Questions? Oh, oh I'm sorry, Paul. I got distracted. You sent me We're down, down here. here. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I did call on you, but then Sally took over your question. Oh. So we don't have any chance of getting a nine-hole golf course up on the uh, <laughs> golf, right? We're looking for a solar array. I, if I can fit that up there, it would be that's fantastic. Great. That was the question I was thinking about asking you, but we, we ask it every year. And oh, yeah. It's a, yeah. So that's what... Mr. Uh, Mr. Allen behind us, behind me, has already worked. He'll be my leader with me working on get that program, get that project revived. Uh, I don't have really any questions. Anything I had has been asked, answered. Thank you. Any questions from the audience, Matt? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Matthew Delgan, Town Meeting Member, Precinct One. Just a couple of questions about some of your projects, your upcoming projects. Um, for Brown Pond at Chase and, uh, or at Purchase and uh, Ash, but that looks like it's kind of winding down. I don't see the guys down at Plains Park now. Is that project pretty much wrapped up? Sure. Stephen, you want to get back? Yeah. Stephen can give, it is close. <clears throat> hey, Steve King, town engineer. Um, for the schedule for Brown Pond cleanup, the contractor is due to arrive at the end of April, um, mobilized back into town. He's going to restore his uh, mobile trail trailer down Plains Park. You may see some fill down there right now. That's all clean stuff that they're going to use to finalize cleaning up uh, a couple of the properties. They've talked to all the homeowners already. They have their planting schedule ready to go as soon as the weather breaks. Um, and then they'll be back uh, during probably through the summer to finish up two houses for cleanup. And then they'll be completed. All right, that's great because uh, I, I've gotten positive feedback from a lot of the people that live in that area. I think uh, overall it seemed like it was a well-managed project, even though it was intrusive. You know, people have you know, big, heavy equipment in their backyards. It was quite disruptive. So, so that's great that that's wrapping up. So the next big project is that Crease and Cook. Um, with the brown pond, you took a lot of the spoils and carted them over to, Plain, uh, to Plains Park in the back there. Is that going to happen with Crease and Cook, or are you going to try to keep all that on site? Because you have more space, I think, up in the back. We're approaching it to either for the DEP, EP, either to clean it, keep it on site, or find and have them Just find a site it right for out it. Of town. It would be the absolute last resort for us to have to put yeah, anything back in Plains Park. That's a lot of, lot of material, I think, that right. you'd be carting around. Uh, you, our hand really got forced last year, especially to use Canal Street. Okay. We never wanted to do that. And then um, also on uh, page 29, it talks about uh, some improvements to the twy field at uh, Plains Park. What, 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 is, what does that entail? So right now they're out there working on the, the infield of Plain Park, Plains Park, getting that infield, getting, getting the infield cut, getting the clay out from underneath the sod, getting that and get some new clay put in there. And then actually in the Warren articles, we have, I believe it's $45,000 that we're going to propose to do another round of um, enhancements, especially that first 
first uh, 10 feet of the outfield right. and some other areas down there. Okay. We haven't really done much work out there in the past few years, and we noticed it last year. It's time to get back yeah, out there. it's kind of getting tired, but it's, it still looks pretty good. It still looks pretty good, but it gets tired fast. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it takes a lot of work. I know the guys are down there often. And then uh, this also might be on a, a Warren article, is that Frost Fish Brook project that you talked about, mm -hmm. uh, I think, last month when you were before the selectmen. Is that still on uh, for this year? Yeah, so Stephen came behind. He's working on the design and bidding of that, and we have a Warren article coming up to present to you folks in a couple weeks. Frost Fish Brook phases two and three. It's been <laughs> recommended to do phases two and three combined, which would take us from where we stopped, which is at the Mass Ave culvert right near Coolidge, and take it the rest of the way up to Wellesley Road. Okay. And and that, that uh, selectman's meeting, I mentioned about that riprap and how it's kind of um, created down there at Plains Park. It's kind of like a, uh, a gravel uh, quarry uh, operation where you have big rocks brought in and then yeah. pulverized. It doesn't seem like that's the right place to do that. Can't we just bring the riprap in already at the right size? Why, why do we need to have such a, a, an impact on the neighborhood with all that noise and the dust and stuff? Yeah, Stephen and I, Stephen and I and the designer are looking at places where we can stage rock. The rock comes in in big trucks and then it gets taken to people's yards in smaller trucks. So we're looking to see where we can stage that where it doesn't have to be a plains okay. park. All right. Great. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Bradge for the town meeting member, uh, Precinct 1. I think I heard the three key words to the questions I asked. One of them was the, uh, when I was talking about road work and plowing. My question is, when someone opens a road, whether it's the town or a private contractor, to bring the road back to the condition as closely as they can that it was before it was opened up. Who's responsible for that? And in some of the areas, we've had that discussion before, some of the roads have been treated poorly. They're like going over a... Uh, yep. Uh, who's, who's supposed to make sure, or, or can we make sure, once the road is open, that it's repaired and put back so that it's not like going over a washboard? Sure. That's one question. So that falls under the responsibility of the gentleman sitting to my left. So uh, he has staff that issued the permits and then also the follow-up. And so he works with that staff on the follow-up. We have numerous trenches around town that we're actually following up with the contractor, Thank trying you. to push them to repair a trench that's failed or is not in good enough condition. We have had to shut off contractors, both local ones and contractors from outside town, because they won't fix a trench. So our first mechanism is to shut them off. You're not opening up any more trenches until you... Um, until you get your old trench fixed. We all know the gas company is probably our biggest challenge to work with. Um, we've had some success on some roads with their gas trenches. They're big, they're intrusive. Um, others, it goes two years and then it starts to fail. And now we don't have much liability. We've had some success getting them to come back. They're our biggest issue and we share this with many other towns across the Commonwealth of working with the gas company to come back and fix their trenches again and again. And we'll continue to work with them. As an aside to what I said, be only because of what I used to do. I used to wa watch, while well, I was watching traffic, watch yeah. how the contractors would not do a very good job mm -hmm. of backfilling. backfilling, compacting it enough so that when it was paved over, it would uh, stand the test of time. So I don't know, I'm not saying you'd have to have somebody watching over their shoulder all the time, but obviously somebody needs to be making sure as best you can that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Sure. The other one was the, uh, the conversation about the roofs. A lot of the buildings in town, schools, what have you, are flat roofs. Mm -hmm. I don't have a flat roof on my house, I have a sloped roof. And I don't have the problems that flat roofs have. Is there some way we could do the roofs differently so we wouldn't have to repair them or replace them periodically? My roof hasn't been replaced in a long time. Is there a way to 
do something differently? Yeah, so a residential asphalt shingled roof, you're getting 30 years out of that before you have to go back and you can go over it once. Um, on our rubber roofs, uh, rubber EPDM roof, the lifespan's about 15 years. We usually get about 18 years out of them here in town. Um, the Highland School roof, that's a little odd. That was supposed to be. We thought we were just going for a quick go over until we really dug into it and found out what was under there. The problem with putting the pitches on, now we have to build the whole school differently. The walls have to support a structure to go up. And if we want the same pitch on a school that you have on your house, it's going to be, it's, you know, we're talking about a hundred foot tall school. So that's, it's cost prohibitive to build it that way. I'm not saying it has to match the pitch I have in my roof, but wouldn't it be cost effective if at the beginning you do a little better job so that it's not 10 or 15 years, it might be 20 or 25 years before you have to do it. I'm just looking at the cost effectiveness. Well, so, well we've that's the question of looking at different rubbers and looking at different the okay. PV, different materials, and we're going through that on the Smith School. You know, there's do we do a 10-year, 15, 20, 25-year warranty roof on that building? And we're doing a cost value analysis on the extra cost of each of those levels to pick the one. If it's a 15-year roof, we're picking that because we know we saved X amount of millions up front that's going to pay for that replacement when it happens. So it's a whole cost-benefit analysis we're doing, and we're doing that on Smith School right now to see what type of membrane is going to go back and how thick it's going to be. Okay. Uh, last one is two parts. You're spending the money to do the roofs. Wouldn't this be the ideal time to perhaps consider or install solar panels? Yeah, so we actually we have it um, in addition to the landfill. Um, and Clinton, a couple people for his staff, we've already talked about when we do that landfill analysis. And I know a lot of people are excited about having solar panels at the landfill. At the same time, we're going to do the cost-benefit analysis of putting some solar panels on some of our town buildings instead. It doesn't, we can do it, at, it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be done when the roof is done. Okay. Solar panels go on top of that, so it's bridging, curbing, we can put it in. So we are looking at that for the high school, the Smith School, we'll be doing the cost analysis of can we put solar panels on these roofs. When you look, I hate to be the naysayer, but it's, it's what I, where I live every day when I go to look at something. You think of the Smith School and it's big. It's okay, we have a lot of roof area until you start counting up all the rooftop units up there, the hatch, and all of a sudden, and there's a skylight here, and now I don't have all these big wide open spaces. Um, even the field house at the high school has all those rooftop units on it that chop it up and make it solar cost prohibitive. But I've got the staff now that we can look to see. Is there a building we can throw solar panels on that's cost effective? Just like you would do for your home. Just tell me you're working on it. We're that's working on it. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we hit a passionate nerve there, but it's, yeah. The, We're working on it. And the other thing, I brought it up, you know, I, I brought it up before. It's about the solar panels up the landfill. Yep. I know you talked about needing fill. Yep. Is there anybody out there that has fill that isn't contaminated, that is willing to give it to us? Oh, well, no, 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 no. We're going to okay. do better than that. We're... We're, we've talked about it before, we talked about the landfill, as far as filling the horseshoe in, right. as far as getting a permit from the DEP to allow us to put something in that's not contaminated, but something that's hard to get rid of, something like our street sweepings. Fill the horseshoe with street sweepings, which we could get paid to put them up there. What so that's the, the road, that's the road we're heading, to be a revenue positive thing to fill the horseshoe. The material that's coming, being piled up on Endicott Street from the building to, uh, torn down, is that considered contaminated? Yeah, we wouldn't want to put that okay. there. Okay, all right, just asking. I see a lot of it down there. Yeah. All right. I know we can't. We're working on that. I know we can't do anything other than have the gas flame from the yeah. gas that's being produced down there. We can't put a wind turbine or something on the top of that. <laughs> You know, a night light or something. It just looks. We studied the last wind turbine. We were going to put it on as part of the high school project, but it was cost prohibitive. Uh, uh, but the wind turbine prices are coming down. The uh, prices to buy the turbines are coming down. Would the turbines be any more useful with the landfill the way it is now, as opposed to having to or trying to fill it in level or level it level it so that you could put the solar panel? Or both of them down there? Would, it, it, would they both work? It's the landfill's not the site for the the wind turbine because we need a foundation under the, under it. Okay. We can't be drilling into the landfill. Okay. We need solar panels that float on the top. Okay. So we need to look at turbines someplace where you can you know, hook it to a building, small one, or somewhere where the soil's clean, so we can drill down and put a foundation in. 
So, so really, all I'm asked, just tell me you're working on it. <laughs> well, you wouldn't believe me if I just said we're working on it. No, 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 it's all I want to hear. Thank you. Mike, you want to follow up? Yeah, just on the Highland School, um, will that roof work in any way interrupt the school day for them? No, oh no, no. We're we're designing the project. It's the contractor. Uh, it will um, will be will be working most of the work. Anything that would affect the school day is done during this during the off oh, during the vacation. Okay. Great. Yeah, we've done roofs with school. I know some, work could, some work could some work could be done, but we yeah. won't interrupt. Work with the principal yeah. to make sure. Yeah. Um, and if we did that, we'd like fence off where the contractors are, and it'd be something approved by the principal. Okay, thanks. Can I ask a follow-up? Yeah, so what's the status of the traffic light on... Um, oh, yeah. You know where I mean. I was going to talk about an electric. So, electric. so oh, Maple exactly. and Summer, so we had a great project, and the, they cleaned up well. The mast arms are back-ordered at the factory that make the mast arm all the steel. Supposedly they have a steel shortage. <laughs> I'm not... Wait, Thanks, Pete. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that's but that's so. All going so, to the war effort. Yeah. <laughs> so the the posts and the arms are custom made for our project. They're in a queue at this factory that makes them, and we're in the queue, and we're not going to get them until June. So it looks like the the columns and the mass times are coming in June. As soon as they come, the contractor's ready to put them up, and all the electronic gear, everything else, the wires are pulled. We just got to get those those metal posts in. We're waiting for them to come. Where are they coming from, David? <sighs> Stephen, Ohio. Ohio. It's still better down there than what it used to be. I mean, that's not the way you want the project to end. But believe me, as a Summer Street resident, purely for education, is that probably driven by the steel tariffs? I don't know. It's actually it's only one supplier that was available when we bid the contract that actually made that ornamental steel. Uh, that's why there's such a shortage there. They had everybody in the queue from every state, every county that wanted to do traffic lights, and they're just trying to keep up with the pace of the, uh, the supply and the demand. I think my quote to Stephen was, we're going to drive down there and see where we are, what we can do to moose ourselves up in the queue. <laughs> sure, but, it's beautiful there this time of year. Yeah, Ohio, right. I had to promise him a football game, but that's all. <laughs> Any other questions? Move the budget. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, um, we've in your budget book this year, you'll notice we, we rearranged the way that we presented the capital. There's now a standalone section in the back. So, um, whereas in years past the capital would have been approved with each department or request, we're going to ask for a vote on this list tonight because that's how it's going to be presented in the uh, certificate of appropriations at town meeting. Sure. Okay. So, I can talk about a few items. Um, Top of the list, that's the 16-foot-wide the rotary gang mower uh, for DPW. This is uh, one of our main machines, kind of the workhorse of the fleet. This is to replace a 2009 gang mower that's at the end of its useful life. It's got almost 3,000 hours on it right now. What's a gang mower? Oh, the one with the flop outsides. Okay. So it's, it mows 16 feet wide. So it calls it a gang because it's a gang of a lot of, a lot of, mower, a lot of mower blades. Um, the second request is from the street division under Brett is to look at a, a small paving machine that would actually do sidewalks. It's five feet wide. Instead of hand raking the asphalt, they can pour the asphalt in it and the paver can go along and lay down sidewalks. We currently either rake that by hand right now with rakes and wheelbarrows or we hire a contractor to do it. So this is pretty much standard for the industry how to do sidewalks and trench repair now. Um, the third item is replacing existing uh, the existing nine-year-old pickup truck that's in the fleet. The next one is a $30,000 in the grounds division. It's a multi-use um, tractor. The brand we have right now is a Steiner. It's something we can put mowers, blowers, um, rakes on the back, all those different types of things. We're replacing a 2008 with the same, same kind of tractor. Right below that, DPW Forestry is a four-in-one bucket. This is a bucket for their existing loader. They have a regular bucket that scoops dirt, but when we bought the machine, we didn't have the funding to buy what's called a four-in-one bucket. It's like a cleanup bucket that can work like a clamp, which is necessary. They're picking up branches and leaves and other debris. They've tried to get this in the budget for a few years, and it hit the priority list this year. So to get a four-in-one bucket, which would go on our existing machine. Underneath that, DPW Buildings is a pressure washer. This is $4,000 for a larger model pressure washer than you may have at home um, that 
the current one at, in the buildings division is out of service and they've been borrowing one of, the one from the garage. That's the DPW items. And we know we've worked with recreation at the bottom. They have a, a mower, one of their mowers that works down at Endicott Park is in need of replacement for $30,000. The Endicott Park Ranger staff, they do a lot of their mowing down there themselves. We take care of the equipment for them and they do the mowing. Steve, Steve yeah. yeah. Uh, how, excuse me. How long have they been using blowers at Endicott Park and anywhere in town? Oh, geez, for the last 10 years, I'd say. Okay. Any possibility of revisiting it? Shortening the hours, limiting the hours? They're so menacing. Yeah. Um, Horrible for the environment. Yeah, it's, I know, it's so, it's, they've come up because they, it's, it's all about man hours, trying to keep the staff down and get it cleaned up, and they're so fast. Um, so with the current staffing levels that we have, that's required us to use the blowers. We do try to keep them, you know, seven to five is, you know, the hours, we're not out there before seven o'clock in the morning with them. If, if anyone is, let me know. We don't plan to be out there before seven in the morning. Uh, but right now with our current staffing letter levels, we need to use the blowers. And I believe there are more pollution uh, controls in have coming into effect for the motors. Every time we order them, it seems like they have more pollution control, more filters on them, which would help the environment also. Well, that for you, today, but. do you have to use the blower on grass clippings? You don't, I mean, you can leave them. No, nah, we can't leave them on the athletic fields. Okay. It would, Endicott it would, the Park the, the, is the, different. It, it would get too dense. Yeah. Right. We can look at, you know, can we leave them on the, I don't, you know, on the, um, on, on the regular turf. Yeah, that'd be interesting to find yeah. out. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, there is, I know there's a lot of blowing when they're cleaning up the driveways on the end. They're doing that. It's, it's about neatness, <coughs> clean that up. I'll have to revisit that to try to minimize our blowing as much as possible. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, uh, and Steve, was there any other items on the list? The police cars are in their normal no, I would, I would rotation. Comment on the last one. The, the $27,000 is not to replace the workboat. We have a, a pretty heavy-duty workboat down at the marina. Uh, the full replacement cost of that is closer to a quarter million dollars, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, we, we certainly are not in a position this year to allocate that kind of money. Um, there have been some significant repairs needed on the boat in the last few years. So this uh, appropriation... Uh, is sort of the first year towards starting to fund the replacement of that boat. We're not, it, its demise is not imminent, um, but it's coming. So we wanted to start by putting a little money in the capital account for that. If we have a repair that we need to do this year, we'll have a little money outside of the operating budget to cover that. But the idea would be to um, hopefully uh, put a larger appropriation in next year, ultimately looking to kind of pre-fund it and then replace it that way. Steve, so, what does it do? So this is, this is uh, Chris Sanborn in the, uh, down at the marina. They use this for... Um, I think pulling boats. Yeah, so it's um, the 25 foot enclosed cabin boat and go out in all weather. It's able to pull boats. It does have firefighting capabilities. So it's an all weather it's a rescue boat. boat. And it's, yeah. I, I want to say it's early 80s, late 70s. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's been repowered vintage. before. Yeah. It's a classic. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think just as, a point of, just as a point of reference, if you look on pages 76 in your budget book, this is where um, this list is located. There's, there are other items listed on page 76. The, the capital outlay for the utility, the utilities, water, sewer, electric is included in their budgets because they're rate supported. So when you vote the utility budgets, you'll be voting their capital. It's only the tax supported, which I'll also comment in a moment is not necessarily accurate because we fund this out of the um, So we have some, if you look in the, I see Ted giving me a, a curious look, so I'm going to flip you back to the beginning. But. No, but so the question, so like we talked about the pages and the ballistic stuff, I see. How come, it, how come it's losing the fire budget and also here? So Pat, Pat was acknowledging it in his budget presentation just that it's being replaced this year, but it's included in the back of the book as a capital outlay. And, and just in terms of presentation of budget, we found that I think Rich Maloney last year and his, his inspectional services budget is around a half a million dollars. He had to replace a $24,000 SUV, so year over year, it looks like a pretty significant budget increase, but it's not an operating cost. We're trying to segregate those to the back. So, and we do, and it's just a point I, I would make. We, correct to match the budget. we would like to be moving our capital outlay into the levy if we can ever create enough capacity, but as, as we stand today, we need surplus from the prior year to fund the following year's capital expenses. So we, we do support our capital program to free cash, uh, mostly, or debt service. So. Are these in a warrant article? I, um, 
So if you look, no, they're not in a Warren article, but if you flip to, um, let's go to the front of the budget book, and you look at, I'll take you to page two of the budget book. So from the top down, you, obviously the top of the page is the property tax levy, but if you go down into the final section, other available funds, you'll see a $596,000 number, and that's, that's for the capital outlay, the tax-supported capital. We call it tax-supported capital outlay. But it's the, the funding source is free cash in that case. Excuse me, where are you on that page, Steve? Come here. Right here. About, uh, on page two. Oh, I got it. I got it. So free cash is tax supported capital outlay? Sorry? And, and Did I say that right? Yes. The so free cash is being used for capital Thank outlay, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. But those are interchangeable terms? No. Oh. Free cash so, is the funding source for the capital outlay. Okay. The header on the right, screen right, is misleading. Right. I just wanted to point that out. It. We don't, we don't, we should, but we don't. And that's a, that's a goal that, you know, budgetarily, that's a, this is a longstanding practice, and I think we'd like to, we're looking for ways to, to create the capacity to shift that over. Um, and philosophically, the, you know, in theory, your, your capital, I mean, if, if you're using free cash, which is technically a one-time revenue, it should be supporting one-time expenses. Um, generally speaking, rating agencies and auditors consider capital to be a one-time expense. But if you look historically, we've never really spent less than a quarter million, four hundred thousand dollars on our capital. So you're saying that like it's a different, basically it's a different vehicle every year. But every year there's a certain amount of how much I spend. You can bring your change of maintenance capex that goes along with running. running Correct. Down. So because and it's a regular item, it's part of the, the operating budget. And we're not getting pressure from the auditors or the agencies to change it, but we just feel it from a best, pra best practice perspective, yeah, we'd like to make that change. So it's a goal for next year. We're looking at these, they were, it was $62,000. Okay. And that's, I guess that from, that's all I would really um, comment on. We'll talk about some of the utility capital in the utility budgets shortly, um, but that that's the, uh, we'd be looking for a, a vote on this. I think we've been kind of asking questions as we go along. Do any other members have a question? No. Nope. Phil. Should you want to vote on this right now on the capital outlay? After Bill has his moment. In the sun. Bill Bradstreet, uh, Tommy oh. member, still Precinct 1. When you talk about the power washer, where does it or where can it be used? Or how is it used? Is it used to uh, clean up the, say you, you use your trucks in the winter, chemical sand or whatever, are they washed out to keep so that they don't rust away? Are they used on building? Is this unit? Uh, this one's used strictly, well, primarily for the buildings division to clean sides of buildings, to clean decks, to clean walkways, all that type of thing. Okay, but it, it might wash a few of the town, the buildings division vehicles. However, primarily it's used on the buildings. Okay, I'm not talking about you know they have instituting a car wash, but yes. if it were used uh, or could it be used to help maintain or lengthen the life of some of the vehicles, body wise, I suppose. Oh yeah, it does, and we have separate washing facilities down at Hobart Street for the vehicles. Okay, so we have like a, a wash station with a ramp and stuff. Just, yep. a, just a just a question. Good question. Yep. Thanks, Bill. Is there a motion? Move the capital outlay expenditures. Second. Is there a second? Second. He did. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, wow. You're all the way We're down there. We're the cheap <laughs> seats down here. It's hard to get hurt. So just, <laughs> just to clarify, so <laughs> it's <laughs> the, this vote would be for the five hundred ninety-six thousand dollar total. So it doesn't include the school, the bus lease payment for the schools, and it doesn't include the rate supported utilities. Right. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. That said, if you voted twice on the water trucks, I'm sure the department wouldn't mind having twice as many, but we don't have the money for that. We don't have the space to park twice That's as true. many. So. Did we have the bus payment, did we approve It'll that? It's part of the... That's, That's also part, part of the warrant. Warrant. Okay. The water budget, pages 35 and 36. Uh, once again, a couple highlights from 2019. Oh, we're very pleased to get the, the water main replacement done on Mass Ave. That was, we would have loved to have done that a year earlier. Uh, it was a need, we know the, the road was in rough shape, a lot of breaks. So that's been replaced, now we'll get out there and pave it this spring, early summer. 
One of the items that jumped up in the middle of the year was the emergency pump drive replacement at the water treatment plant. What I still think of is our brand new water treatment plant, over 10 years old, and uh, one of our the main pump drives, they or the both the main pump drives fa uh, failed up there. I, apparently, they have a 10-year lifespan. I've now learned, and um, so middle of the year we had to get in there, um, shut the plant down, and buy water from Beverly, use our wells, and the staff had to get in there and find drives, and did a great job replacing it. It w had a um, pretty good effect on the budget. However, um, the crew really rallied, put together an emergency plan to supply water, so the customers didn't even know that the plant was shut down and that that happened, and we got it back, right back online quickly. Uh, so we were able to um, submit this through the town's internal program, and it was the 2019 project <coughs> of the year in the town. So really proud of the water treatment and the water division staff for the work they did up there. Uh, we put it on the list. It's uh, something that the, the staff is like, we really got to work on these, and the new fountains around town. If you've noticed, this is the water division putting them up. Uh, if you look at the Wenham Street Playground, at the dog park, so the new style water fountains are being put in at the town parks around. Do you mean bubblers? Uh, bubblers, oh, yes, okay, bubblers, okay, yep. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, so the new, bu so get out there, new, the new bubblers. So, and, and they're just very well received by everybody. We had the old ones that have been there forever with the, the well tile, with the pipe sticking up, and, and they're, they're very durable, however, they're not very user friendly. Um, well one down at Andover Street, we've had to work on cleaning up well one. This is also the well that we're dealing, you may have read about in the paper with the PFAS things. We're still working with the DEP on that. Uh, we're, so we're going to have this well retested again in the coming weeks by the DEP to see what's going on with PFAS at this well. Uh, is this going to be a concern? Because it looks like the regulations will likely be changing from what they were a month ago uh, to what they're now. The levels were at 75 parts per trillion. And now we're expecting either the regulation or a health advisory to be in the level of 20 parts per trillion, which is right on the level of what you're even able to test for at the limit, that, that tight. So um, more to come on, on well one over there in Andover Street. This is the well right on 114 to the right. To, it's on the northbound side of uh, 114 right at the Danvers-Middleton line, that well right there. Near the treatment plant. Um, not really. It's... Oh. It's, uh, as you're going north on 114, you pass Ipswich River Road on the right, and right at, when you cross, the, on 114, you cross the Ipswich River. It's mm -hmm. right there. Mm. Yeah. Right there next to the road. Okay. Yep. Um, so the next one is the Green Street Booster Station. We've got that designed out to bid, uh, good favorable bids, and now um, Mr. King is getting ready to build that. And so that Green Street Booster Station is going to finally get the water pressure up in that Green Street neighborhood where it should be. Yay. It's one we've been trying to fit in the budget for a long time, and now it's finally going to get built this summer. <coughs> but the design went very well. The bidding went very well um, this winter. We're pleased with that. So booster increase, increased pressure? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because of their elevation, they have low pressure. Yep. For, great. for next year, uh, boy, you know, we can't help with the goals but dabble into the, um, the Warren articles. The first is our... Our, our capital improvement program for the water mains. If you recall, we appropriated money the year before last to do a study, a real study of our water mains, put into a new program so we do a thorough analysis on what water mains we should replace when, and that's based on when they break, what they're made of, how old they are, how important they are to the system, are they the right size, what are the soils. We've completed that program. We now have a 10-year capital, capital improvement program out before us that tells us which water mains we should replace. So Warren article, coming attraction, what we'll be asking for is to fund the first five years of that. It's we're recommending to spend $2 million a year for the first five years on water mains. And we've worked those borrowing costs into our water rate model. So um, obviously we're going to have to see some kind of increase in the water rate to fund that. But we finally have a well thought out and well engineered plan on really replacing our mains before they all start failing on us, worse than they're doing right now. The next one, we are in the middle of our, now in the middle of our Water Management Act permit renewal. This is the agreement that the town has with the state that governs how much we can pump, how much we can use, water we can use, when we can use it for outside water use. All of those regulations come from the Water Management Act permit. It also includes limits on how much water we can pump out of our wells and, and the reservoir. So we're in the middle of that process right now. Uh, we'll be doing this jointly with Middleton. 
Middleton's combined with us. So it's going to take a lot of meetings and working with the town of Middleton also because they're a partner in this with us. So we're just gearing up and working on that. Um, water treatment plant, yeah, our brand new water treatment plant that's now over ten, now 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, the first one isn't the water treatment plant, it's the chlorine booster station. So that's, um, we've got the design and the study done on that, ready to put that booster station, which is being recommended down by the Foley Hill tank down near there to change the <coughs> chlorine levels on the east end of town, which we've always had a problem with going way back. We finally have that design out to bid. We will be for a town meeting for there's a small amount of money we need to get appropriated to be able to uh, complete the project, but it's ready to go with a good design. The carbon filter improvements, again, we're going to have to be look at our, to upgrade our water, the carbon filters at the plant. These are one of our main uh, filtering mechanisms that it's actually carbon that sits and the water flows right through it and takes out the contaminants. We're going to have to improve those this year. And we're going to have to do some work on the ozone system, uh, which you'll see it's in the operating budget. One slide that we wanted to, to bring up, it, not great news, is in all these years of water conservation and restrictions on the Ipswich River, restrictions by the DEP, we're trying to run a water business with declining sales. So we have in regula regulatory costs, equipment costs, salary costs, which are all going up, and pipes that we need to replace, and we're selling less water. So it's not great news, but we needed to, to put a slide in, and uh, the town manager was integral in designing this slide to just to, to send that message that we're running a water business, and we're going to have less water to sell, and costs are going to go up. And um, so we're working on all rate models, to how, to, how to best deal with that. So more to come on that. And the, the, I know John knows that the, well, he's already had a preview on this. Mm -hmm. And John, as a water and sewer commissioner, will be, they'll be dealing with this this year and next year probably on how do we do, what do we do with the rates? You know, how, well, how do we establish the rates? We all know we have a very modest base rate and then tiered rates. Is it, is it done right? Is it cost effective? Is it charging it the right way? We're taking a hard look at that. Mm. How much, I mean, given where we've been on the conservation, how much lower do you think that could go? So we're approaching, I mean, as far as how much capping our water withdrawal? Yeah, like, yeah, like, you know, how, like, how, well, you know, the last couple of years with the water and restrictions, how many, how many more, like, you know, how much more behavioral modification room is there? We think like could it could it conceivably go down another fifteen million cubic feet over the next ten years? Oh, I'll provide an answer that David. Well, no, he's asking habitually. Can sure. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, some of its habit changes. I think there are two aspects. Water, to two aspects to that. Yeah. Yeah. There's water restrictions. There's you know. Will the community on your toilet? Yeah. Yeah. What, and what have you? Yeah. How much more? Like I guess one asking is how much of is that is like how much of that low hanging fruit has already been gathered. So I think as far as individual habit, water habits, I don't think we're at the, the rock bottom yet. You know, we still are using showers that we just crank it on. And you go to Europe, they've got buttons on the shower. You know, it times it. Um, you know, we're still, um, you know, having hoses that are washing cars and, you know, not that, you know, it's still not that restricted. So habitually there still could be movement down. As far as regulatory, lowering our regulatory limits, we think we're doing a really good job right now, and we think the restrictions on Danvers are more onerous than any of the other towns around. And so we're not going to, we don't plan to give up any more regulatory restrictions without a heck of a battle, I guess and is I, what I want to say. And I think it's going to be a battle. I think um, I was not around for the last uh, permit process, but my understanding in talking to most folks is that it was a very contentious and litigious process. Um, We've received our order to complete from the DEP, and what they're asking for preliminarily is, is um, sort of tipping the hand that it's going to be another difficult process. Um, some of the, so I think David's right. I think, you know, in terms of continued behavior modification and um, enhancements and efficiencies, we can, there's more. Um, but the trend that we're on is not sustainable. We have a system that only gets more expensive, not less expensive to maintain. And we're, it's going to be a tough spring for the Water Sewer Commission when they're looking at, and when we talk in a couple of weeks about WARN articles, we, we have projects, we've stripped out all of the projects that, we, um, that aren't critical to do, 
we're still going to be dipping right on the edge or below our, our um, uh, you know, we have a funding pol fund balance policy for the water um, retained earnings, and we're going to be below that. And so the only way to make that up in a, in a proprietary fund like this is through rates. Um, and, and part of our message to the DP is, to David's point, we've been doing conservation for years. We were leaders in that field. Uh, we received virtually no credit for that in our last permit. Um, we're being asked to further restrain our, restrict our use. Um, we can't utilize the gallons permitted to us under our current permit because of some um, nuances in the permit that make it impossible. And um, we, and, and so s stepping aside from that for a moment, I, what we talked about the grants at the top. We, Danvers partnered with six other communities two years ago. We received a, a pretty significant grant from the DP to do some actual modeling and science. Um, we found something that we suspected but was proven out, and, and that's that when you look at the total waterfall in the, in the basin, in the Ipswich Basin, I don't know how many, uh, 80 to 90 percent? 80 percent of it is the backflow transpiration, whereas the, the actual supplies were drawing water from the Ipswich River Basin is between 1 and 2 percent. So 90 percent of what falls flows to the ocean. Um, and so there's a, I, I think there's a, there's a notion that water suppliers cause the river to go dry. And it's not supported by science because the, the river went dry 100 years ago when there were no water suppliers <coughs> pulling water from the river. And the river itself doesn't go dry, but there are tributaries to the river that are historically, based on geology and everything else, go dry. But the, but the popular narrative is that the water suppliers cause that problem. And the study really, I think, disproved that. And proved, and I, Bill, the way Bill Clark put it, is that we don't have a supply issue, we have a storage issue. That there's ample water in the basin, we just don't capture it and, and utilize it very, very effectively. And, and I don't mean to drag this out, but again, I think in the 70s we assembled properties thinking we would build a second reservoir. We were planning for something like this. The EPA at the 11th hour pulled the permit out from underneath us. So we now own, we're, we are the proud owners of a lot of wetlands in Middleton that is essentially useless, can't be turned into a reservoir, um, and we're sitting here today, um, you know, preparing to do battle with the DP to maintain what we have. And the point I think we try to make every time we talk about this is that we are, um, again, there's another notion that water suppliers um, are not looking out for the environmental health of the water shed. And we think that's 180 degrees in the wrong direction because for, um, for some groups, the watershed is a recreation, and for the water suppliers, it's a vital source of our, you know, we have a moral and civic obligation to make sure that that's a sustainable resource. And so we are trying in this permit process to work with other municipalities, work with the MMA to try to make that case. Because if, if in five years um, that trend has continued, we're going to be facing double-digit rate increases each year, or we're going to be compelled to go and spend 30 to $40 million to tie up to the MWR. We won't have any other choices. Of 30 to 40 million to tie into the don't quote me on that because I just pulled that out of thin air but it's not an insignificant we, we, it would be a very significant cost to, to make gonna, that <clears throat> okay I'm, I'll, I'll wait yeah, till later so. well I, I've got a question though so I'm go so, ahead um, thank you uh, Dave you made a comment uh, a few minutes ago that you feel that the DEP is more restrictive on damage than other communities yeah. I'm just curious what makes you feel that way because well right now when we signed our permit last time. We went to appeal. We, okay, we mediated with them and we agreed to mediation. Salem and Beverly hasn't signed their last permit yet. They didn't, they haven't signed it yet. So, um, so we had that. So Lynn and Peabody, they were able, they had registrations that were years ago because of their industry, their registrations, those are something the DP can't touch. Because of their industry, those registrations were so large, they were able to throw away their permits. So the DEP wasn't able to get at them and Can make all the restrictions on them. They're both The MWRA. difference between registration and permit for just yeah. a second? Yeah. So each, each water supplier has a registered amount that they can withdraw. And what, what David is saying is that when those registered amounts were calculated, Peabody and Lynn had industry. So the amount of water they were using in their baseline were right. here. Sure. And Danvers was an, an agricultural community. So our, our registered amount is here. And so we need a permit issued. And the permit comes with a lot of restriction and regulation and, and conservation right. requirement. So we have a registered amount. We can't get by without our permitted amount. Because we have a permit, we're subject to the regulation. PB doesn't need to worry about that because their That's registration true. is so high that they are sort of grandfathered in and bulletproof within at Mass General Law. So we're subject to what they call enhanced conservation. We took 
hundreds of phone calls last year. Why are people in Peabody they can water and we can't? Right. And that's because we're subject to enhanced conservation because of the way our permit structure. Interesting. And groundwater pays no mind to jurisdictional boundaries, so it's we're we're it, we're in a, we're in a, it's almost a, a double whammy. I think the town did what they thought was the right thing the last time and mediated to an outcome that they felt was fair, um, and ultimately were penalized when the supplier next door to us essentially refused and is under no restrictions. And it, it, it kind of defies logic. So uh, some of us remember when we had a hospital. And what ended up happening was is that basically regulatory forces were put in place that in essence made it impossible for municipalities to maintain their hospitals. Are we reaching a similar situation in the future where, in your opinion, we may be faced with no choice but to expend the money or to deal with them. To, I mean, uh, uh, is, you know, I, th I was thinking about it. Is the reason they're this tough on us because they're just tough, or is it because this is an effort, in essence, to take small municipal water divisions and make them join in with the MWRA? There's definitely a push by the DEP to do that. And we ran those numbers hard before we renovated the treatment plant. There was a whole detailed analysis. The cost to hook into our MWA were actually more expensive back then than they are now. Mm. So it's, it's more attractive. I'm not saying it's attractive to hook into MWA, but it's more attractive now to hook into the MWA than it was when we looked at the treatment, the treatment plant back in the early 2000s. The towns that are being really encouraged by the DEP to get on MWA are abandoning wells. They're not abandoning a surface water like we have. So we're not sure how the DEP would look at us ab abandoning a surface water. And for, we could never afford to have a surface water run that plant and hook to MWA. Now we're getting high costs on both ends. Yeah. So, <coughs> so it's too early to tell. But the thing we do know is that, yeah, there's some force to a lot of towns. You saw Wilmington, you saw Reading go to the MWA rather than um, rather than enhance their own facilities. And the MWA pipes are coming this way. They're getting closer. So you are. Yeah. First question. Is it foreseen that the MWRA has limitless water? So right now, if you look at what's called the safe yield of the Quabbin Reservoir, the Quabbin. they're well below those numbers. So they're, they're not. They're not worried. They're not, they've got a lot of water. They they've plenty. got a lot of water. Right. Okay. Myself, being, you know, we all want to be conservative, we're thinking, wow, wait a second. Mm. If we have M everybody hooked up to the MWRA, we have everyone dependent on one water supply. Yeah. That sounds like single source failure to me. Yeah. So I don't like the feel of that. Right. So it's, it's, we have a lot of decisions to make in the future, but water, it's, it's the essence of our civilization, and it's going to be tricky to, <coughs> to maintain. Well, I'm going to ask the, the, the chairman could kick me out, all right? But I've been... <laughs> I've been Not thinking yet. about asking He's this question for, for, for months. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm already here. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Well, you can't go much farther than the way you're over there. You've got to be sitting with Duggan for this <laughs> I don't think they'll have me. <laughs> Anybody been in the Navy? Anybody been in the Navy? Our water treatment plant operator has. <laughs> None of us have. When they, when they put out these carriers, 5,000 men and women, how do they get water? They have desalination on the ship. Really? Yep. That's the question. That, you know, I know it sounds like w it, the science has been there forever. And here we go. The oceans are rising. Next thing you know, you're not going to be putting lights at the bottom of Summer Street and uh, mm. 62. I'm going to have a dock down there, mm. you know, with a boat launch. But there's water all around us. And I, I don't think Danvers can afford a desalinization plant, but could the state? Could, uh, could you get a consortium yeah. of right. Beverly, Peabody, Salem, uh, and Danvers? I mean, I, these are wi it's wild. I understand that. But has anybody ever talked about that at all? Yeah, so we've done, when we've done two um, water source studies, mm -hmm. we've looked at potential water sources in Danvers. The desalination plant, both individual for us and regionally, has been looked at every time, especially where we have brackish water. Mm -hmm. Our water is not very salty in the river. 
So it ridiculous price-wise. I mean, yeah, it not ridiculous, but never, not, it never got to the cost-effective yeah, point. But it's not out of the question long yeah. range. And I mean, we all know it takes a lot of energy, a lot of energy to desalinate water. So when you have a, a carrier that has a nuclear power plant that's generating 80 megawatts of electricity, mm -hmm. they can they can run that that desalinization plant. Yeah. When we have to pay three megawatts a year to desalinate the water, it makes the cost very expensive. Well, Dave, I think Clint likes the sound of that, actually. Cl oh, yeah, yeah. Clint wants to sell electricity <laughs> back there. Because you have Clint. Thank you, Clint. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay, yeah. I think it's worth it. So, yes, it we've looked at it before. We'll be looking at it again. crazy. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right. Why don't we try to keep moving? Yes. I don't know. Am I going to get... That's my, I got us off track? No, that was, it, no, it was a good conversation. Nobody. So obviously, water division, we need to keep the operational costs as low as possible. We're trying to do that while we're running the treatment plant. Uh, so we're at a 1.65% a increase on the salaries. The, as that, the 4% increase in salaries, the biggest chunk of that is the 25% of the civil engineer position that we put in here. Um, if we follow down the page... The other expenses, we've got gas heating. We've got um, it both a little rate hike and a, um, the average trend is up in the water facilities. However, the propane's down, which is great. So those are almost washing each other out. Um, pump maintenance. This is that now that we at that water treatment plant, we've done a, um, looked in advance of the CIP of replacing pumps, and we need to replace pumps faster than the rate we're doing before they break on us. So we're doing that. Um, Software maintenance. This software, ma this is the water modeling software. This, so this is the new software that we integrated that replaced our hydraulic model and our capital planning tool. So now we've we bought that software. It's in place. This is the annual fee, so that we have our modeling, and this is what generated our our capital plan. This software here. And in addition to that, there is a piece in our software about the the new online billing software system. So we're switching our online billing software. It's how many years old, Pete? 20 years old, 15? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's yeah. our original online billing software. We're finally replacing it uh, with the new, it's called Invoice Cloud, used by many other utilities, and we'll be using that for water, sewer, electric this summer. Great. Um, other contract maintenance, primarily that's work that we need to do on our ozone system up at the plant. And sludge removal, this is based on how much we remove and how much it costs to get it there. It's based on the average. We really work hard to minimize how much sludge we took out of the water treatment plant. However, we are seeing a trend upward this year. Banking services, that's the cost that goes up that we, um, when people pay using credit cards and that type of thing. The gasoline and, and the diesel, so we are seeing an increase in rate for next year. So for next year, across all of our the town budgets, we have unle unleaded projected at $2.54, diesel at $3.17. So that's what all the town budgets are projecting for next year. Um, if ever, anyone has a crystal ball better than that, then mm. we'll, we'll try. But the water meters, unfortunately, this is meters that go in new houses, new businesses. We actually recoup the cost, but it has to, we have to pay it out of this budget, and then we take revenue in. They cost more than they used to. So we, this is just same number of meters, just an increase in price. Uh, the next two, chemical treatment and the permits and license, Brett? That's the chemical treatment is the, uh, the orthophosphate that they're using at the plant. We're using more of it. So obviously the, there's an increase because we're actually, the doses has changed, we're increasing it. So that's why you'll see that 12% that increase. And the permits and licensing is the different licensing that's used for the uh, spe specialized licensing for the treatment op plant operators the treatment and distribution licensing. Mm -hmm. Health and dental costs, I, I assume you've talked, they've done the health budget already. And support services, you've done that budget. And uh, luckily the debt costs are going down, our existing debt. Mr. Chairman, that's the highlights of the water budget and we can take other questions on pages 35 and 36. I think we covered a lot of it, but uh, Paul, do you have anything? A uh, couple of things. Um, when you talk about uh, doing the sewers, the sewer lines, I think you mentioned. But this, this is, water, we're doing water, water right now. Water, but lines, yeah. water lines. You, and you're going into a five year yep. a money a request for five years, mm -hmm. right? And with all the lines that we have throughout the town, what, what, what's your estimate as to how many years it would take to replace 
either everything or what has to be replaced. Are you looking down the road 15, 10, 15 years? It's a 20-year 20, 20 20, plan. It's a 20-year plan. Yeah. Okay. And hope, you know, in 20 years, we might have to be coming back and doing the Tobin Bridge again, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Perhaps, but if the plan looks like we'd be in really good shape. Good shape. If we were able to fund that plan, we'd be in very good shape. Great. So there's there's a there's a good longevity lifetime to this. Okay. And then, and the the other one that you you talk about water Canal Street, mm -hmm. correct? Yep. Um, that's going to be, from my understanding, a permanent fix. Correct? Mm -hmm. To whatever the needs would be for that particular facility. Yep. So if we were to get down the road ten, uh, five years, maybe ten years, somewhere in that neighborhood where we're doing public works building, mm -hmm. perhaps it's not going to affect that at all. Well, it, when we did, when we purchased that property, right. and we look when we designed the new building and all the designs that we're doing to that mm -hmm. that garage down there, they're all done in such a way to make that a very saleable commodity, which okay. theoretically, if ten years from now we were able to do a joint DPW somewhere, we would definitely look at the look at the effectiveness of selling that okay. and getting revenue from it and combine water with the new facility. Excellent. I think that's the real long-term goal. Good, good. Um, am I ahead of you or not? Now, I just, just page 34. Um, I see bonds listed, okay? Now, we were talking, we're still. That's sewer. Sewer, that's okay, sewer. so I'm, that's fine. I'm all okay. set then. Sally? Um, I'm good. Thank you. Gina. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the response for the Boston Globe article that mentioned oh. Danvers and about possible contamination. There was a firestorm on Facebook. Yeah. And um, having the town and DPW, DPW post a response on Facebook was extremely helpful. So thank you very much. Um, it definitely allayed my fears. Thanks. <laughs> oh, and one more question. Sorry. You were so if the rates are being analyzed right now, when might taxpayers see water rates go up? So right now, water rates are staying this, you know, till July 1st. So any okay. water rate increase would start after July 1st. Thank you. Ted. Um, I have a couple quick questions, hopefully quick. Number one, the banking services, um, do we personally charge people for the use of a credit card when they pay the bill? No, we pay for that cost. We pay that? We incur the cost, yes. Um, is there a thought of changing it? Um, it and I realize it's not a huge number, but like put it this way, I can't wait to. I'm hoping that this new software I can do auto pay because I never get that. Yeah, yeah. Discount. We. Like, um, I would love to. Do we want. Pay. So we want people to. When we started it, and our feeling still at this time is that to encourage people to use it and you know yeah. um, not come in and you know all that um, to automate it and make it the, the whole office more effective. We feel that it's truly a service to the customers for us to absorb it and then to just pay okay. the bill. Fair enough. Um, uh, number two, from a rate standpoint, where do, how do we compare to uh, the adjacent municipalities? Middle, we're middle of the pack. Okay. Um, number three, do you guys ever check, for people who have two meters, do you ever check to see if there are illicit bypasses? In the homes. Anecdotally, I've, I've heard of these. Hmm. So, when we did the meter replacement program, we definitely looked for those. And I can't, I'd have to get back to you. I don't believe we found any. Um, I'm aware of situations where we've found meters that were tampered with, and our new software has meter tampering software in it. So, we know if a meter gets tampered with. So, so right now, we're counting on the software to pick that up for us. So you'd sort of know if there was a high use in, in a neighborhood and it wasn't being captured. It, it, would, it would get dropped out, right. Mm -hmm. We may be giving you a call after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's it's got probably, 14 no, kids. Most of them I've heard of, and after many beers, I couldn't tell you who they were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a friend of a friend. <laughs> I don't drop times, but I'm just telling you. <laughs> um, and lastly, are there any economies of scale besides ignoring either state subsidies or regulatory inequalities between what we're required to do to provide water and what the, the, the you know, the Massachusetts, what, what would you just call it, the M? The Mass Water Resource Authority. Are there, are there any, are there any uh, challenges of, of just running a small water business that make it tough to compete or is it all the fact that we are on a different regulatory playing field than some of the adjacent 
oh, it, it's our economy of scale is tough because you know if we had 100,000 people living in town and, and a water treatment plant, it would be the economy of scale would be much better for us because we only have 26,000 plus Middleton and we're trying to run a water treatment plant. That makes it hard to run the business. But if our sales had if our sales were up five percent from five yeah. years ago as opposed to down five percent, we'd be doing a lot more capital lot work. We'd be do, we'd be we'd be farther ahead. We'd have a more efficient system. Um, so it's it's a struggle. I mean, we'll we'll talk during the warrant. You'll see requested projects versus the uh, recommended projects, and there's a there's a delta there. And we would like there, there ideally there isn't a delta there. You'd like to do all the projects in your capital plan and uh, on time, and we can't do that. Mike. Uh, 52424 uh, other contract maintenance. Can you describe what that is? So that was the, the work that we need to do on the ozone treatment process next year. We have to, yeah, that's the, the, the thing that treats water with ozone. We have to do maintenance to that system. It's driving that cost up this year. All right. And uh, 57803. Support services. You get that running. Yeah. So that's the cost recouped by the town for accounting services, mm -hmm. HR, etc. Yeah. All right. Just for one quickie. You mentioned the Middleton refund. Uh, is that going to stay the same for a while, or? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> hard to tell. So we have a, a our first meeting with Middleton is on April 23rd, and we need to start discussing the next phase of the contract with Middleton. That contract, that intermissible agreement between us and Middleton, will dictate what happens to that Middleton refund. Okay. Too early to tell. Good luck. Yeah. How how is the uh, the collection? We get that thing where we, the testing. With a little pink piece of paper that came with it that they had us put out and grabbed. How's how's that gone? Was that something that's completely fake and someone just grabbed my water for me and? The lead and copper. What was water thing? What are you talking about? I literally, I got I, somebody from the water department Gee, left yeah. a, a like a jug, and said, "Fill this up with water." And there's a they they said and we left it out and they picked it up and. In for testing. Okay, so that was part of the lead copper sampling program. Okay, that and, and that was. Yeah, so that was we had, we we're doing testing for to okay. see how corrosive our water is. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. It was only a yeah. couple of weeks ago. So we don't. Have the yep, results. that's part of the lead copper. We have to test X number of houses. You just got me nervous because I'm thinking, some, why is someone taking my uh, water? What so is? <laughs> I'd like to make a public service announcement on that note. Yeah, here we go. I was talking to our water treatment plant uh, manager this morning, and he was uh, informing me that when the state comes out and does these random tests, they generally will identify lead in someone's personal plot in the fixtures within, you know, on the on the on the homeowner side of yep. the system. Right. Um, we have customers who have been pinged randomly multiple times. We then make uh, strong recommendations that they change out those services. Um, we can only have a certain number of pings in each round of testing before uh, we, we get a slap on the wrist. Right. And so we would encourage those who have been found to have this stuff to, to think seriously about beyond the health implications. Um, it change hurts the system if, 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 if we're routinely having these pings and people are ignoring they're saying, I'm not worried about it. I'll just uh, leave it. I'm sure you have a new enough house. I'm sure your house is, is fine. But that's part You're of the lead sample, lead copper sampling program. You're saying people need to upgrade their pipes to not Correct. Lead. And I, uh, yeah, and not to be insensitive, because that's not an inex inexpensive Correct. undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if the same house is tested every couple of cycles, that ca those, we get five or six of those, and then it's a, it's a it's a yeah. it's a ding, and so it hurts the it hurts the system. Yeah. But we're looking through the whole system. Actually, Stephen is the engineering staff looked through all the services, the pipes that come from the street, and make sure none of those had old what they called goosenecks in them. And right now, there's it's they've, out of our whatever is eight thousand connections, they've got it down to fifty nine that we're concerned about, and we're going to go out and start doing some test pits on some of those. And we may end up testing fifty nine to make sure, just dig in the ground because we're not sure what exactly that person's pipes are, just to make sure that the ones leading to their house are good. So, so I guess, I, I, now I'm confused, <laughs> even more so than I was. Was, were we just picked randomly? Was that the no, town? The state, um, how'd you do it? Sure. Sorry. Steve?
Steve King, Town Engineer. So the state picks, uh, because of our, our recent lead and copper results, we had to add an additional 30 houses onto our regular 30 that we have prior to for testing. So it's up to 60 houses. They are randomly picked based on the year of the house, um, uh, partially the construction, or, or maybe the neighborhood. So you just happen to be that random selection um, for, the, for the draw for a sample. Okay, so all right, so I, I probably should have done it the right way instead of Scraping the. <laughs> oh, top of it. Was you should do. The, it should have. You should have got a notice. We really would have loved to let the water run before you. Should have got a notice saying that you do a first fall and then you, you go back. Was, and all right. We followed directions. it to a T. You would have. Nice. Thought, I thought was my wife was very concerned that we did it exactly how it was. We didn't run our water for, I think, a day and a half before. So, yeah, <laughs> That's correct way. Yeah. Yes, you so did the right way. So thanks. That's fine. Yeah. I <laughs> agree. Right, how are the houses chosen? Uh, by year of construction. When, you, when was yours built? 1960s. No, 1980s, 85, 87, somewhere in that range. It's, it's typically most houses after 1980 where there shouldn't be any, any lead used in the plumbing right. or within the street. But sometimes we do catch some that maybe had some lead soldering that went on in the, in the, uh, in the internal plumbing of the house. They don't want to know about our old houses, Sally. They don't? Do they know you have <laughs> They know it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, I asked for that one. <laughs> what? I'm just thinking now, I got hit in the head so much as a kid, now I'm drinking lead water. I mean, it's, uh, no, no, you're, you're fine. <laughs> Make a note. We'll let them know how his samples came out. Those will make a shut off me. Any questions? No, it's um, You know how. Um, we were talking about the re reduction in um, use of water. This is probably a very crazy idea, but what if we tried to find more customers? I mean, what if, like, Middleton is part of our system? Is there another local community we could pull into our system? It's a double whammy because we're also restricted by the DEP on how many gallons of water we can pump per year, per day. And the most restrictive, we're restricted to how many gallons we can pump during the summer. They won't let us. Yeah. So we barely pump enough. Yeah. We barely are regulatory, uh, under a regulatory limit, we barely have enough for our own customers. Which is why from time to time we pull from St. Beverly. Right. And why we have our, what we call the water use mitigation program. The DP made us do that when there's new development in town. Every new development has to pay us a fee that we then spend that money to reduce water elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So like the new residential developments around town, they've all paid water use mitigation fees. Those are in an account, and it's part of the budget, the water use mitigation account. And then that account we use to fund things like the, the toilet rebates and the shower rebates, and all of those programs are funded to reduce water use mm -hmm. for the new development. Do even smaller developments uh, have to pay that? Over two houses. Okay. Yep. But I'll, I'll use, okay, then I'll use an example, uh, the, the development of the uh, one house into three condos on Pond Street. Yeah, if it was one to three, Just care. they yeah, had to pay it over any, two, so they yeah. had to pay it. Any commercial or condo unit that yeah. is getting redeveloped will have to pay the water use mitigation. Yep, yep, so Pond Street had to Thank pay. You. Sally, I'm sorry. It's okay. So um, we had a, a low pressure and disc serious discoloration up at Kirkbride uh, yesterday, the day before? Hmm. So oh, yeah. right now we're investigating a potential water main leak in that area. Uh, there's some confusion about who actually owns the main, whether it's the state or us. But we've been, we've been trying to figure out how we can at least isolate it so if we do have to fix it, we're able to do that. It's one of the reasons I asked because what we heard from, from the management company made it sound like it was something up, up there that, that happened, something that within there response no, level of responsibility that's why i asked because it wasn't clear to me was it the you know the flushing process can discolor water at first flushing is starting. i just didn't yeah, know what was going on yeah we, we have been working in the air trying to isolate that the main that we think that is leaking up in that in that section of uh kirkbride thank you <laughs> that's all i have thank you for the budget proposal you eliminated all my questions with the numbers um sure. my questions were already um went over um 1.6 is the outside, the, in this one. Mm-hmm. Good job. Bill? Could you give them a name? 
Bill Bradstreet, <laughs> Precinct 1, our meeting member. When we talk about lead in the water, most of us, not most of us, a lot of us might have had lead pipes that they used in the past for bending purposes. After that, we went to copper with lead solder. Now they have solder that's lead free. The lead solder, is that enough to affect a home? So I didn't get one of the jugs like Mr. Landers, so I, I'm just curious. So our water is treated to make sure it's not very corrosive. So we, the, when we mentioned the chemical zinc orthophosphate, we put that in the water and set the pH of the water so that it's not corrosive with lead solder. So if our water, if in normal conditions, if you had lead solder in your house with our water, it's set up so that it should not cause a problem with lead solder. If you had a lead pipe and that water sat in there for three months and then you turned, it, turned the water on, there's no way we can treat the water so that lead wouldn't go into that water. So that people with lead pipes, we encourage them, run the water. Before, once you run the water, you flush the system out. You don't, there's, there's no, you're guaranteed there's no lead there. But in, if it was just copper pipes with lead sopper, we also don't want to be corrosive with the copper. And we treat our water so it doesn't corrode with the copper. So with our water, the way it's treated, you know, problem, lead, cop, lead solder is never, is not a problem. If you have solid lead pipes, if anyone solid lead pipes, it shouldn't be a problem. However, we would caution anybody to let the water run because you can't trust the treatment 100% if it's a solid lead pipe. So I can drink my water with the surety? You can drink your water with surety, yes. Thank you. Could I ask one quick? Uh, yes, I think it'll be a quick follow up question. Just um, the capital outlay items that sure. are in the water budget, uh, they appear on page 76. Could you just quickly run through the sure. three items? There's three capital outlay items. Um, one is to replace a 2009 pickup truck with the plow, one is to replace a 2005 one ton utility body truck. So the first one was uh, 40,000. The second truck is 55 because it's a one-ton truck. The last thing is the the UPS battery backup system for the SCADA system at the water treatment plant needs to be replaced, and that costs 30,000 for a total of 125. And what's that battery? What it's that? at the water treatment plant for the SCADA system. That that's the system that monitors all of our water operations. We have battery backup. If if the power goes out before the generator can go on, the battery backup will power it. And a quick sense of what the trucks are used for? Oh, so the, the, the first truck is used by the water division crew that's out in the field. The second truck is used up at the water treatment plant. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the uh, M MWRA and the restrictions that, we're, that are placed on Danvers. Are the MWRA res less restrictive with their uh, rate payers as far as you know the summer restrictions and things like that do they, do they have more usage yeah they have different set of restrictions than we do most of the communities more, and more. that's because the Ipswich River is a stressed basin All right. okay yeah. All right. thank you I'd like to move the water budget second all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed The uh, highlights in the sewer budget for 2019, uh, the, we completed the rehabilitation of the sewer pump station down on Endicott Street. This is the one that's past 128, just past the old railroad bridge down there. The renovation of the one that's right by McDonald's, that's underway with the replacement that we funded last year. We're going to put it behind where the old Zoots Cleaners was. That's where the new pump station will be constructed this year. Phase two of the sewer rehabilitation program continued. That's with the lining and spot repairs. So that program is putting lines in our pipes. It's also replacing the spot repairs of different system where groundwater or other water is leaking into the sewer system. This program is both required by the DEP and it saves us money because it's keeping clean water out that we would otherwise have to pay to treat. 
when the water gets to Salem. The Crane River Crossing, this is where if you're on 128 and you're going north or towards Gloucester and you look to the right um, where we cross the Crane River, you'll see the sewer pipe is on a set of pilings where it goes across there. So the sewer pipe is actually it's in, it's in midair or on these pilings. Uh, so our staff, our water division staff, working with um, an outside <coughs> contractor, the brackets had all rusted away, the pipe was in danger of failing, and they constructed and installed new brackets all the way across the river to put the pipe on the old pilings. The pilings were fine, but the brackets had all rusted and broken away. So it was a great job done by the staff. And our cleaning inspection program continues uh, down on the west side of 128. For next year, like I said, we're gonna continue the rehabilitation program, that lining, spot lining repair program. Uh, we kind of talked about this before, the Frostfish Book Program. We're hoping to get phases two and three funded at town meeting this year, so we can continue that. It was well received by all the residents in the, in the uh, neighborhood. It seems like it's working well. We're also hoping to do the bidding and award of 7 Canal Street, uh, possibly with a, a request for funding at town meeting. The last one's a new one. Um, this is the river siphon interceptor repairs. So we have one of our sewer interceptors that's actually, it's, you, it's the town of Danvers's, however, it's maintained and owned by the South, East, South Essex Sewer District, but it's solely for us. This crosses the Porter River from River Street, the end of River Street, across the Porter River over to, over to Dodia Pumping Station. These pipes that go across there are constructed of the same material and the same vintage of the one that crossed Salem Harbor from the town of Marblehead that failed, and they had to do an emergency repair on. So that caused the SCSD and ourselves, Stephen King worked with them to do an inspection of our pipes, and we're gonna ha and we found that the pipes are in danger of failing. They measure the pipe thickness and they do a whole, it's, a, it's an amazing scan by running a machine down the middle of the pipe. They can actually see what the condition of those pipes are that are buried under the river. So right now there is a plan underway to do lining of those three pipes that go under the river. This is a, a project, it's gonna be, we don't even know the money, it'll be over a million dollar project that'll be funded through SCSD. And it'll be funded partially through our cash reserves there, partly through our rate that we pay them. They'll, they'll do the work, they'll bond it, and this project will um, have to be paid for by us. This is redoing those pipes. The good news is we wanna get out there and fix them before they fail. The bad news is we're gonna have the cost of um, replacing these, or repairing these pipes that go under the river. The sewer budget, unfortunately, we couldn't keep it down at the, at the level like we did with the water with the 1.6% increase. We're at 4.4% uh, increase overall. The biggest drivers of that in, this, in the salaries, salary increase is the same as on the water with that 0.25% of the civil engineer and the 2% salary increases. The SCSD increase, that's our biggest one. So SCSD is $4 million of our budget by far. It actually came in a little lower than we expected. So they're up, the SCSD budget alone is up 2.5%. So that's $98,000 just for SCSD. Vehicle maintenance is up 17%, $3,000. And that's just based on the average of what our repairs cost on the vehicle. You know, everything that the garage spends repairing the sewer vehicles gets charged to the sewer division. We keep track of those costs year to year. Pump maintenance, in addition to the sewer stations that we're repairing or rehabilitating, there's still work on the old stations that we need to do to keep them running as they get older. And so we need an increase in that account of $24,000. And that's for work on our existing pumping stations. In the software maintenance, this is the Increase in this, this is primarily due to the invoice cloud software system for the, their portion in the sewer of that online billing software. And then we have the miscellaneous grounds maintenance. Yeah, that's just the repairs <clears throat> around the sewer stations, the miscellaneous repairs that need to be done around each of our sewer stations. So some fencing repairs, other repairs, just to the grounds. Sewer lateral materials, this is the repair the pipes that we put in the ground. 
uh, a $3,000 increase just due to the cost of materials. Health and dental and support services, I believe those mimic the uh, water increases. On the capital outlay, we do have a request this year of 170167 for capital outlay. There's three items in that. One is replacing a 2008 three-quarter ton pickup truck with a plow for $55,000. One is to replace one of our portable tow behind generators. We have some of our sewer treatment plant, some of our pump sewer pumping stations do not have emergency generator. So we have two portable generators, which we in, a, in an outage, we would take one of the portable generators to that station. We have two of them, one's in need of replacement. That's $50,000 for that. And then we have the final payment, the three of three payment for our street sweeper. So we did a three year lease to own on the street sweeper. And this is the last payment on that, 65,000. And we'd be we will, glad to take will, more questions on that. David, then we will own that. Correct. John? Um, pump, maintenance. Yeah, pump maintenance, that's work on the sewer, on the, the sewer stations that we do primarily in-house. That's buying the parts and materials and have a contractor to help us at times. But it's just maintaining existing plants. Okay. Um, uh, that's fine. I'm, I'm all set. <coughs> Sally. Thank you. Well, $50,000 seems like a lot of money for a... A generator I mean I don't know how much they cost obviously I, I assume I assume that number comes from quote, some analysis that you've done what's the question yeah that's I mean we've priced for, to <clears throat> get a generator size to run a sewer pumping station that's what they cost that's why it's it's a 1989 the one we have so um, Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I thank you. I appreciate that. On page um, thirty-four, I guess this is these are debt costs, right? Uh, at the top of, of page thirty-four. Correct. Mm -hmm. So, um, one item that stood out to me is the um, interest on temporary loans. That number is significantly higher, four hundred fifty percent increase. So that's relative to the $4 million authorization we had a couple of years back. As part of banning that money, we're now required to make principal payments upon that in this year. So that's increasing that cost for this year until so we permanently finance. Okay. Um, that's it. That's it for me. Thanks very much. Mike? What's the, what's the useful life on that once we own the street sweeper? Um, what's the expectation that we'll be able to Hopefully keep we'll that? get eight years out of it, yeah. another five. Great. Thanks. That's it. Mike? Yeah, every, you've answered everything. I just have one question, though. You got in your budget commentary, the Water and Sewer Division budgets increased by 296, 233. Yet if I add the two final numbers up, it's 265, 18, and 134, yeah, 625. So what am I doing wrong? So, are we, Mike, we're in the, the sewer budget, the... Okay. On page 32, you say in your budget commentary... Oh, 30, oh. The fiscal year 2020 water and sewer budgets had increased by a total of 296, mm -hmm. 233. And if I look at the, the two end, co end uh, numbers oh. for the water and sewer, it looks like it comes up to 345 something. Unless I'm doing something wrong. Is that, is that 296, that old number? We've got to check that number. I'm concerned that, that the 296 didn't get changed for the final version. Right. So, so the, the budget, the final version. I once add them both up, I get three point three nine yeah. five one. Yeah. Because that was probably before we got like the final SESD and all the final numbers in on the budget. Okay. Apologize for that. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, just the, yeah. the four million dollar borrowing, what's the, uh, with those bonds, and what's the life on those? So it's a, right now it's a short term ban, so we haven't permanently financed, but because we're, we rolled over the ban a second year, we're required to make a principal payment as well. The idea would be to permanently finance in the near future. Okay. What, what, uh, what are we, I don't want to, when I say what are we waiting for, I don't want to sound like I'm being impatient. I'm just curious what the thought, like what the thought process is on keeping it, um, I'm not permanently uh, I think we want to bundle as much as we can together. Yep. So we've done 800,000, then another 800,000. I think either this summer or in the near future, we don't want to permanently finance that. Group it together with some of our other general fund debt and other debt. So basically getting critical mass yeah. to get to, to take it to So you said, Rodney, that we're required to start making principal payments with the line it's called interest. So Yeah, and that's just sort of a an accounting term for this just because we don't have principal accounts set up yet because okay. it's still a short term note but okay is this is this line item going to continue to go up every year is my concern no eventually so that'll become its own line item the four million dollar authorization and it'll clearly delineate the principal and the interest payments moving forward once it's permanently financed okay and then that'll drop down to more of a historical you know short term interest on anything we ban okay thank you Sally uh, thank you. I just have a an inquiry. I don't know if anybody has a number for this, but I feel like I have been hearing about Frost Fish Brook for decades. I just I can remember it. I think I might have written a story about it when I was at the paper. And every year, it's so here we are. Uh, drainage is going to be like forty thousand, and then more drainage. So is this just an, why is it a perennial expense and is there some accounting of how much and a, is there a better way to do this? We don't want to turn this into pick on DEP night, but how many years did it take Rick to get the permits in place from the DEP to do that yeah, so modest project? Seven so years it took us to get a permit so from the So Frostfish DEP. Brook, this is actually the second time at least that the town's done Frostfish Brook. Yeah. And I, I was involved the first time they did it in 1986, <laughs> and all the DEP would let us go was go trim the bushes, and we tried to apply to put the rock stone and all, and the DEP said, no way, you don't need to do that. All you need to do is clean it out and clean the trees out and... All we could get approved was to do the clearing that we did back in the early in the 80s, and then it didn't last, or it lasted 10, you know, it lasted 15 years. So we went through on Frostfish Brook an extensive permitting process to armor those banks, which we believe is a real permanent replacement. It'll still take some maintenance, but this is a long-range repair. Um, Be refresh my memory, David. Why was it necessary? Oh, because Frost it turned so many corners. When they took the brook and when they made the Woodville subdivision, they took a stream and they made it made 90 degree corners through the neighborhood. And so if you look at it on a Google map, Google Earth map, you'll see it turn. So every time that goes around a corner, the water on a big rainstorm, it wants to scour that banking out. So it erodes the banking out so it gets closer and closer to people's houses. So we have to blame Campanelli, not just. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They, they took a stream and turned it into <laughs> yeah, a. Yeah, I went there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How were they allowed? They were allowed to do that at that time. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> it. So it was so, the fifties. So, 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 it's probably <laughs> it's probably surprising that they even did that. That they didn't just bury it fifteen feet underwater. Uh, so, yeah. so the second thing that we've got in Danvers, you know, we're a, it's a farm town, and many places they did culverts across the road with those old just metal pipes, that are just a metal culvert. The bottom of the metal culvert rust rusts out. Just like on, when, the, when the Cabot Road culvert in front of the high school failed, the metal pipe rotted out. Well, now we've replaced it with a concrete pipe and a concrete head structure that lasts, got a 50-year lifespan to it. However, it's, it's expensive to do it that way. Um, we have other culverts that are where roads have been widened out. You know, we know 62 was widened out. When that got widened, it was an old granite box culvert that they stuck some pipes on the end. So that's why we had to dig up Maple Street and replace that. It was with a whole pipe all the way through. So we're repairing stuff that was 
you know, done yeah, in it right. cost inexpensively before or it was mm. added to or it's like remodeling your house. We're in a swamp and put in fifty right. condo <laughs> units. <laughs> yeah, and then and with drainage we're in a swamp we, and put three hundred houses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With drainage we, with drainage we have mother nature. You know, the Mother's Day storm caused havoc. Mm -hmm. When it you know, we saw flood levels that were unprecedented. It just eroded the bankings and caused damage to headwalls. So that's the with drainage we're fighting Mother Nature. And there's more coming. Oh yeah, there's know. more coming. So uh, that's an interesting thank you for that. Yep. Good to know. Paul. I have nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, none of us believe that. It's a, it's a, it was a, it's a great presentation. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Bill. While he's walking up there, Mr. Chairman, um, just circling back to Mike's question about the, the, uh, the narrative versus the budgets. The 296-233 is the, the, the sum of the bottom line increases when you take back out the SESD increase of 98,910. We didn't have that final number when the first narrative was completed. So it really, the budget's correct. So the 343 is the actual increase. This narrative would not include that SESD piece, so. Thank you. Mr. Bradstreet, Precinct One. Here again. We talked, about, we talked about we have two portable generators. One needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. My question is, the one that needs to be replaced, is that kept as a spare, junk, or traded in? Do we're we gonna, get any benefit from it? We haven't made a final decision on that yet. You know, right, right when it comes, to, if we get the funding for it, and we go to, we'll make, we'll look at that. Is there any value to keep it? Should we, tr what's the value, when we go to get the quotes on the new one, we'll definitely get quotes back to trade it in, see what they look like, and if, and we'll evaluate that. We're not sure. Either keep it, if a good price on trade-in, we could trade it in, or we'd auction it off like we've done a lot of equipment this last year. Okay. It wouldn't be something that you would keep in someone's spare, spare time, try to, uh, bring it back to oh, it, it, it works right now. It's just costing more to keep it working every year. So it would be good to keep it, but we just got to make sure it's not going to kill us on repairs to keep it. And to give the other question, we have to pipe our sewerage to Salem? To Doty Ave, then to Salem. Yep. Okay. Um, is the waste that the town produces, is it steady, decreased? Increased. Uh, obviously, there's a cost to us mm -hmm. for what we do, and then for it to end up where they do what they do with it. Is there? Is this another educational thing about? I'm sorry, but years ago, when California had a water problem, it was if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's <laughs> brown, flush it down. Is that something that might help us? So. So, so having the Good having Great those advice. two wouldn't help us. We have one combined system for yellow water and gray brown water. All the, all goes down the same pipe. The one thing that we can do to control costs is to keep the clean water out. That means that's why we have the inspection program for the sump pumps in the basement when a house sells to go make sure people's sump pumps aren't pumping into the sewer. Because if someone's cellar pump sump pump is pumping into the sewer, we're paying for every gallon that puts in. As opposed to it being pumped right. into the uh, storm. Right? The program that Steve had with the, with the slip lining of the pipes and the, and the spot repairs, every hole they fix on that sewer system keeps clean water out. We don't have to pay for those gallons. So okay. that's, that's the way to keep the clean water out. I'm still curious about helping with my California. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's with a two-pipe system. Any other comments or questions? Oh, just a quick one. Will sewer rates be going up as well? Um, we're, we're expecting a, a, a modest increase on the sewer rate. Uh, we're expecting, you know, higher, but just, you know, sewer rate seems like we have to go up a, a few percent every year just to cover operational <coughs> costs. We're hopeful it'll be just around that one, but we're expecting a above normal increase for the sewer, sewer uh, the water one. Water. Okay. Thank you. One more question. Linda Flaherty, Precinct 6, town meeting member. Quick question about the sewer inspection. How long has that been in place now? A couple of years? Six, three? Um, the, the, yeah. Yes, it's been for about uh, five years now. Five, five years. Five years, okay. Yep. And it's for all properties sold? Yep. Okay. And about how many inspections have been done over the course of the five years? <coughs> Just under 1,200 inspections. Just under 1,200. How many bad guys have we caught? 
to say roughly, we found about 256 sump pumps. Um, we've had a legal, well, 56. 50, yeah. We found that disconnected. 56 that were hooked up incorrectly. That were hooked up incorrectly. Okay. I mean, we, we refer to them as maybe misinformed, not uh, bad guys. <laughs> we, we like to assume that they didn't know any better. She might remember some of these people are our clients, so she should be. <laughs> I should, I mean, okay. Um, do we have an estimate as to how much it costs to do those inspections? Every inspection costs the town how much? Because I know we don't charge anyone for the inspection and have it over the course of the past five years, but it costs us something to do it. Yeah, so we're doing it with in-house staff. Right. So, you know, take an hour's worth of someone's time to go do an inspection. An hour. Yep. Okay. All righty. So that's how much it's costing us to yeah. catch the misinformed guys. Mm. Thank you. Move the budget. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. So on the electric budget, so now we'll switch to calendar year rather than fiscal year. So for um, calendar year 18, one of the biggest projects that we undertook was to do an electric efficiency audit. This was an audit that we uh, just gotten the report back on. It was mostly financial audit, but we were looking into all of our financial practices and policies to see what we were doing good and where we could do things better. Uh, also, we used that to help. Uh, we had a consultant identify industry trends for utilities like Danvers to show us where the electric utilities are going in the future. Um, so it was good to talk about our financial policies, such as investing our reserves, how we should best do that, or what's the uh, most cost-effective way to do that, what's our limits, um, how are we billing, what do our rates look like. Rates in, electric, in the electric world are likely to change how they're done. Uh, you hear the word time of use rates is probably how we are headed in the future because when we buy electricity, when we buy it during the day, it's a far different price than when we buy it during the middle of the night, but yet you're getting one blended rate. So um, that's the industry as that changes, getting more and more towards rates could change depending on what time of day you use the electricity. Um, so we're very pleased with that report and we're working with the um, electric light commissioners on implementing that. Out on Center Street, you might see the new conductors, the new wires and poles going up Center Street. That's the new 5,000-volt 5, 5, circuit. We did the, in, we, our long-term long -term capital plan had us do our major circuit first, the 25,000-volt system, and now we're working on the 5,000-volt system, both replacing those old, those open, bare wires that are very susceptible to branches and squirrels, replacing those with those new hardened wires. Um, and we're doing it around town. Center Street was a project that we did in-house design and in-house staff replace those conductors and it'll provide service up there for a long time. Signalization of Maple and Summer, I wanted to talk about that and that's the delay. Hopefully June our, our, our um, mast arms and posts will come. Uh, the electric rebate program was revised this year. Um, Clint has information about that if you have questions, but we revamped it to get to the new energy standards. The energy standards have changed since when we did our rebate program. So we do offer programs just like the National Grid does or any of the other investor-owned utilities. And we try to advertise that and want to promote. Uh, even though we're in the business of selling electricity, we still want to give you rebates to conserve electricity. So um, we have a budget for that and want to do that. The next one, the solar net metering program. We revised that program also. We still have a program where residents, if you put solar panels on your home, when they generate power and you use it in your home, you're getting free electricity. When, you, when the panels generate more than what you're using, it goes out to Danvers Electric and we credit you for that. It goes into your bank. Uh, we've had to change how we pay you for that. What we're doing is essentially we're paying you the fuel cost for that that goes out into us. So it's not the full retail rate for the excess. However, you generate credits equal to the fuel cost of whatever you generate in excess of what you use. Uh, we're also continuing to work with other larger um, properties around town to do solar arrays where we can hook them directly to our system and do, then we do purchase power agreements with them. So we were contacted with one this week. We're still looking at that. During the year, every year we have new power contracts and we'll talk about the portfolio in a minute. This year we did a three megawatt contract with First Light Hydro. It's up in Quebec, another hydraulic 
uh, so it's hydropower. So it's another adds to our renewable portfolio. So that was the newest one this year. And lastly, but not least, we want to commend the residents, our demand management program. This is what we advertise in the summer to get people to reduce power at the peak times. It worked again. We saved $319,000 after the costs, that, after all the costs that cost us to advertise the program, to rent the generator, everything, we were able to save $319,000. It's going to continue. Peak power is very expensive, and um, we just appreciate everyone's support. Going into next year, um, we're going to implement the recommendations from the efficiency audit. We're starting our electric vehicle program, so we have plans in place to put charging stations here at Town Hall. We're looking over at the Hobart Street parking lot for charging stations. We're going to add 100% electric vehicles to the uh, town's fleet. So we'll have a, a car at Town Hall, one in the electric division, that electric vehicles that we can use. And we're also looking at a rebate program for home people in Danvers that own electric vehicles. There's a lot of people in Danvers already own electric vehicles. If you ch smart charge the vehicle, meaning you charge it at night, in the middle of the night, it's, it's very inexpensive to charge it. We want to encourage people to do that. And we're going to offer rebates to people if they charge their vehicles during the night in the smart time. So that's, that'll be coming out. One of the things that came out of the efficiency audit was we need to upgrade our financial management package, our work order, our, how we manage our inventory down at, um, in the electric division. Right now our inventory is on handwritten slips that you fill out and you put in the bin. We need to upgrade that. We've been waiting for it. It's finally here. Uh, so we have a team together and um, Clint will be involved in it and Peter about upgrading our work order and financial management system. Very pleased to finally get to that. Um, our online payment upgrade to Invoice Cloud we talked about. And also we know we've gone around and replaced the uh, street lights with LED lights. Now we're working on all the private area lights. Those are the ones that are rented through Davis Electric that light up parking lots all around town. So we're going through to get those all transferred over to LED. On the budget summary. So this is a summary of pages you know, 38, 39, and it goes on more detail in 40, 41. Next year, our purchase power expenses are expected to go down. We expected power to cost a little bit less in 19. And we're already seeing that in the 19. We're already three months into our 19 budget, and we're seeing lower costs, which is good. Um, right now, working with the commissioners, we think we're, right now, as far as our year ahead budget, we look to be able to keep the rate stable until June, and then we're looking at a decrease in the electric rate for the final six months of the year. So we're hoping for a substantial decrease to the rate um, for that year. That's, that's the way it's headed. We do expect to sell slightly more electricity than last year. Um, that's, we base it on averages. Even though people are using less power, it's really driven by the weather. If we have hot summers and cold winters, we sell more electricity. Uh, so it, it's weather dependent, but the trend is that hopefully we'll sell more than we did last year. <clears throat> Our other expenses, we're going from 12.8 million to 12.7. We're keep trying to keep our expenses very uh, much the same. The payment in lieu of taxes that goes back to the town is based on our revenues. That stays as similar. At the bottom of the page, our capital improvement program. So what we are projecting to put into the capital um, is our depreciation, our depreciation number, which we have, this is the range that we put in between three and 5% of our plant value. Right now we're running our capital program on 3% at the lower end. In our capital program, which we'll talk about in a minute, we do have some substation replacements coming up. The next substation that's due to be replaced is the one down behind Liberty Tree Mall. We call it the Northland substation. It's right there by Verizon at the back end. That one's due to be replaced. That'll be a multi-million dollar project. So probably in the next couple years, we're going to have to ramp up how much we put into capital. That three will have to go to four, press five to one year, and then back, we'll ratchet it back down to three again after that project's done. So that's our, our advanced planning. The capital program is in your budget book on page 43. 
43. If I could just one minute to summarize in 2019, our biggest projects are up top, you'll see the work order and financial management software system. Then you'll see station 42 upgrades. This is upgrading the control house at our, our primary substation where all the power comes to Danvers, is. which is the second one down, station 42 control house upgrade. Right. You'll see that's gonna be 225 this year, five next, then three, a significant program that we've been waiting on. Where is station 42? Off of Bow Street. Its location is secret. Um, yeah, very secret. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if I could um, take, then there's our route, we have some routine things going down, then, then you'll see about 11 items down, Northland substation, Constitution Lane upgrades. That where we're spending 312 this year, then you'll see 2.2 million, 2.2, that's, that's right now the estimates to, um, upgrade and replace that substation. Very early in the design, so those are um, planning numbers only. Those will get refined during this year. Um, um, can you just jump in? Sure. Where is the um, Danvers Port substation located? Danvers Port? Uh, behind, behind the market basket. The one when you come to Town Fair Tire? right across so from there. On Endicott Street, yeah. yep. like the back entrance to Market Basket, right, right there. Yep. So then I don't want to take a look, but just so I would, everyone can look at this and study and I would take any <coughs> other questions that you had on the capital program. How many did you say uh, charging stations you were planning on putting at uh, Hobart Street? Well, right now we're planning on putting one double so it would be two parking spots yeah, okay. in Hobart, and then, we'd have, and then we'd have two here, one for municipal, one for public up here. Up this way, yeah. Up here, yep. Okay. And then we're gonna have one down at the electric light on Borough Street for staff use, for a staff vehicle. Do you have any idea what it costs for someone, uh, I mean, maybe I don't have a electric car, but it, do they do that? Can they, can they uh, set up a system? Can, they can set up a system right in their home, can't they? Yeah, so people can, and that's when we have, people have smart chargers they can buy, or some mm -hmm. cars are have a smart charger in. And what we're after is when you come home, you have it wired in your house, so mm -hmm. you come and you plug it in. But what we want to encourage is for the car not to start charging right when you plug it in. We don't want the whole town of Danvers to come home at 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock at night. If everyone plugs in at the same time, and everyone's, all the charges go on, we're gonna see a big spike. Can they and be set time-wise? Yeah, time so when you plug it in, we have a smart charge, so it doesn't yeah. start okay. right away, it starts till nine o'clock at night. Got it, okay. That's what we're after. Right. And we can actually, on the meter data, we can look and see, we can see exactly when a car starts charging. Mm. Its load profile is very, it's very clear. Okay. Any other questions on the capital? On the capital? I, I, have, I have one. Sure. The, um, so the chart is, is, has a lot of information and is very clear, um, but, but we still have capital outlay items for electric on page 76. Yeah, so that, those items come under the rolling stock. Okay, so. That's so, where they're funded, right there on the rolling stock. So it's, it's, so the stuff on page 76 is not in addition to what's on. No. Page 43. It's, it's, included, it's included in that in number. It. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Just on, just on the capital outlay. Yeah, just on cap, right. Um, so on the electric, now we go back to the line items. The next couple slides are on the uh, power portfolio. So we should take questions on the line items, and then we can talk about the power portfolio real quick. Just a quick question on the substation replacements. Are sure. they more efficient? What? How do you know a substation needs to replace and what happens after oh. you replace it? Oh, so what we've done is we, we study the station and we test the oil all the time and they all have a, um, a lifespan to them. And so we look at how efficient they are and they, so they, they start to get less efficient. They start to, the, there's contaminants in the oil. So we try to work to replace it before they fail. And so there's testing done on them every year and then we chart out what the performance of the, of the substation is. Okay. 
Thank so this one's been studied. All of we studied all of our older substations that are of this vintage, and this is our one that's due to be replaced. It's also due to loading in the area. You know, we're at the upper end of the loading for that substation based on what we have in that neighborhood, and so we will increase the loading, the capacity of it also. Thank the you. last couple substations we did, we just did the one at the high school. That was that was the one we just did, and then we did the one on Route One. We call it Wood Electric, which is right by the industrial park on Route 1. Mm -hmm. If you go on Route 1 south, you see it right to yeah, the right. Yeah, yeah. That's the other one we did. Thank you. Okay. So uh, moving back to line items in the electric division budget. Yeah. John, any questions? Um, no. no. Sally? Thank you. I. I I can't figure out, like on, on the, the uh, slide that's up right now, mm -hmm. for purchase power expenses for a calendar 2019, mm -hmm. you have 25.5, uh, 25 and a half million. Where does that show up on page, page 38? Because I see purchase power. So it so says 15,135. And then you need to add transmission costs to that. And then we need to add capacity costs. So it's it's that number, the fifteen one thirty five plus other things. Plus here. other things, correct. Okay. That's so the fifteen. That's what we pay to the power plant to the generator. Then we have to pay someone the the trip the wires to get it here, and someone for the capacity of those wires. Yeah, it's purchase power down through transmission by others, right here on page. So it'd be purchase power, system it's control, load mm -hmm. dispatch, mm -hmm. other purchase power, and transmission by others. So if we add those so numbers add together, it comes to that. That's okay. correct. Yep. Thank you. So it shows here that your total expenses are less than the total revenue, right? So total that's expenses are less than total revenue, correct? So the, and the difference comes to the net income? Yep. Correct. Again, I'm just trying. It's the, this budget, of course, every year, um, it's so different from the others. It just right. takes a little bit of time sure to, to grasp the way the numbers are laid out. So thank you for for that and for explaining it. And we talked the other night about being a certified government accountant. So the electric division follows its own federal is it FERC accounting, mm -hmm. and Peter has a utility accountant in his business office, be, and and frankly, more than one person. It's many people assist because mm -hmm. it's a completely different. You, you get you look at budgets that are formatted the same way for three or four nights in a row, and then suddenly you get to the electric budget, and it's it's learning all over again. Right. Michael. Oh, good. Thanks. Just keeps things interesting, though. That's right. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. Page forty-one. What are APA dues? Twenty thousand. Nine thirty. That's the American Public Power Association. Uh -huh. So that's the utility joins that as a whole, and the dues went up. Okay. Out of state travel. Somebody's going out uh, quite a bit here. So out of state travel is so that includes if we send engineers to travel to training outside of Massachusetts. So there's a training budget for that. Uh, we also have a, a conference that's used out of state that usually myself and one of the commissioners would go to with the. Uh, New England Purchase Power Association, and that, that would cover that. So we have a sheet that details where each employee, what training they're going to go to and where. And the out-of-state stuff is funded right here. About, I don't know if you've ever been to any of the uh, hurricanes or disasters. Is, does that come under here, too? So if so, we've sent staff... You participate in that? Yeah, so we've sent staff to work in that. Um, those costs would just hit our overtime budget, the cost of that, and that gets recouped, we get paid, paid back. So yeah, the last time we had our crews going to St. Thomas. Yes, yeah, so we had a crew. Yes, yeah, so we had damaged electric crews in St. Thomas. We had crews in Florida at the last hurricanes. Um, wow. So we're part of a, an expanded mutual aid program. They drove down to Florida with 15 other trucks from this area. Okay. Why is contract cleaning seems to have gone up quite a bit in the last year or two? The 35, same page. Yeah. So if you look. If you look back in, in calendar year seven, 17, our actual was 38,000. Yeah. So, and then we found that we weren't using contract cleaning for the engineering offices. We were using a staff person. They were paying overtime. We got rid of that. So we, we adjust. So we have staff people cleaning us the secure areas, contract cleaners cleaning the open areas now. 
it's more cost effective to do it this way than over time. And one more on page 42. Poles and fixtures, 364.0. You're going to be investing in a lot of new poles or something? Yeah, so that's, so that's part of our, our 5 kV upgrade system. Because when we put the new five, you see, just like Center Street, when we put the new poles, new lines in, we need to put new new poles in also at the same time. Okay. So it's part of that program. Very good. Thank you. Um, so I'm just looking back at the historical, if, if that's okay. Yeah. What, um, what drives the swing in like, employee pensions and benefits? So on, I'm looking at 39. So in, so employee pensions and benefits, we did one year, we did a bulk payment. So we had good reserves, and we chose to do a three-year bulk payment towards our unpaid, unpaid um, balance. Other than that, it's the same, like the towns, goes up and down, same so actuarial. Like, so this is more of like a cash counting than, than a cool accounting. Well, actually, part of this is because we had to accrue the unfunded liability of oh, yeah. the pension and of the OPEB, of the post-employment benefits, was, which is the value placed on the... Uh, health insurance promises to the retirees. We had to bring all that cost on to the book, so that it is full accrual accounting here, and that's why it actually went up. But, but Dave's right. We did, in fact, one other year make a large payment to bring that unfunded liability down for the division. And it actually wasn't catching it up. We, um, the the light commissioners made a business decision probably five years ago now when they discussed it and decided to do it, and they made a five million dollar pay down of their unfunded liability and shave 10 years off of their repayment schedule. So the, they'll be fully funded in 2026, and the town, the rest of the town won't be fully funded until 2035. Okay. Um, then what, so I'm, I'm, I'm also still looking at 18. Is the difference between the year to date and the budget, is that just seasonality? The Q4 is yeah. typically more profitable because of the usage. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's ten, wait, if it's year to date, months. it's because yeah, it's the time of year. The, but they're well ahead. Basically, what I'm saying yeah. is they're well ahead. If you look at the, pro the profit, they're well ahead of budget. And I'm just asking if we give that back in Q4. Yeah. So that's because of the cost yeah. Of yeah. We're ahead right. <coughs> Revenue-wise, we're ahead right now, and that's why we're planning. We're probably going to be able to lower the rate in June, and we'll give that back. Yeah. And then is there is there? And I guess this is a question for all of you guys. Is there a, a so when we set rates, is there a target profit margin that we sort of set? So we try not to make profit. We just put an end of year buffer. We don't want to go in the minus. Right. So we set an end of year. We'll set a, a tar five hundred thousand or a million dollars. We'll just set that as our safety margin mm -hmm. in case something goes awry with a power supply at the end of the year. Right. So that's we just so that we try to if if we tried to do it at zero and something happened in the last yeah, couple right. months, we'd go minus. So we just give ourselves that buffer. And and where are we relative in rates relative to our neighbors? We're the low end. Yeah, yeah. We're the low end. Peabody's a little lower than us. Uh, that nobody else. No. Barely. <laughs> Barely. And oh, I, I should compliment you, as like this is the most reliable power service I've ever had. As a place of work. I think we've had one outage in that crazy windstorm cool. a couple weeks ago. Um, has anybody has anybody ever like sort of given us an estimated value of the business if we wanted to sell it? Not that I'm suggesting. That. Uh, oh, Pete does. Yeah, it, that's come up in the past in regards to uh, how to finance schools, um, and we've done that. And what you end up, you have to buy the um, the debt. We still end up with the contracts for the power, so we have no way to sell the power, but yet we'd be obligated to buy the power. So there's no benefit to the town to um, to Can sell. You transfer it. the contracts too. And no one would buy them because they'd have their own contracts. So if we went to like National Grid, National Grid would have huge contracts compared to us, and they go, "I don't need that. I just want the customer base." There's, I mean, we've it, it's been it's been analyzed. I mean, there are files upstairs in the in the deep yeah. files where we've we've done that cost analysis, um, and I think to the point you just made, I, we we were sitting with a pretty pretty large commercial user a couple weeks ago on an economic development visit, and a facility manager who had been there 20 years said, when he first started the company, it was you know, brownouts and outages every couple of weeks, and it's to your point. I mean, it's it's amazing in his opinion. He's, you know, they, they couldn't yeah, be happier it's, with it's, it. I, I'm quite, you know, like I said, I'm quite happy. I'm just in the back of my mind if there's like an emergency, you know, eight years from now we're in a hole. Yeah. Like you said, with funding schools. Yeah, we thought about that when basically, we, what's the value of this yeah. asset? Not that I'm looking to sell it. It's, right. it's, 
but it doesn't, it doesn't work. Like if somebody wanted to buy our water system, we might put it up for sale. <laughs> this happens to be one that, I mean, I think, yeah. as a point of pride, it was the first municipal light department in the, in the Commonwealth when it was, so it was the, it was the first municipal light department, and um, we have rates that are as competitive as any out there, and I think the service is better, and it's, you know, and I guess for those reasons, maybe we would find an interested buyer, but I'm not sure at this point it would make much sense for us. Gina. Well, the great service is due to a lot of the proactive tree trimming. Is that in this, the electric Yeah, budget? this tree trimming line items okay. is... Um, <clears throat> well, it's sad to see the state of a lot of the trees around it's, the way. It's, it's, it's a part of maintenance of over <laughs> one state. I really think right it reduces that. If, if you look on I the thought page, it was listed there. Yeah, well, we have YG. On the next page. So it's um, um, 590... Yeah, so it's in 593. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, when is the prior year calendar information available? It's just t it's tough to see the last two columns side by side because they're different lengths of time. Um, right, we're looking at ten months in the uh, calendar year eighteen. Col it says year to date October. Yep. Yeah. So so you're looking at ten months for eighteen, but you're looking at twelve months for sixteen, seventeen. Right. I'm just saying, by the time we have this meeting, is it possible to get twelve months of data? For 2018. Oh, oh, by now. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we had the auditors were with us this week, okay. so um, and we're still waiting for actuarial actuarial reports to get the final adjustments okay. to the pension and the OCAB liabilities. Oh, I see. So, yeah, okay. so we haven't even closed the books yet. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and I think the taxpayers will be very excited about a small rate decrease, especially considering the water increase. So yeah. thank you. Thanks, Gina. Sally. Um, kind of a small thing, but what are unused customer discounts? That's actually, that, that's a FERC naming convention, and it's actually reversed. That's actually the value of the discounts that our customers take. Okay. Oh, that is poorly done. Okay. Um, uh, I hesitate to say this, but I just, I will. I don't know if you've had any other feedback. The street lights are so glaring. They are so glaring. They light up my entire upstairs, and I have one on each corner of my house, and they are so bright. And I just wonder, is it me? Are my eyes getting less tolerant of bright light? I find them, and at, at driving around, I find them sometimes to be super, super bright. So we, we did extensive surveys and pilot study to figure out what light we should get and what temperature of the light and all that. We did it, and we have had a few complaints about that people think it's too bright. However, the number of, of people that we get that say they like the new lights is probably 10 to or 20 to 1 okay. over the people that think they're too bright. And okay. safety-wise, people think they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. Her second floor has never been so safe. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. You're electric I don't know. It did shine brightly at my old house. It, you know, it was more bright in the picture window. But That's right. It's um, the other question I had was, are you uh, pleased with, I know that we're members of MWAC. I asked you about this, Steve. And, and I, in previous in a previous life, I did some energy-related legislative work, and MWEC was not great about renewables and, you know, really promoting and aggressively going for renewable resource or sources of energy. Are you, how would you rate there? Well, about eight, seven years ago, we had to make a strategic decision to, and actually chose to get away from part of MWEC. MWIC used to run our par power portfolio, which we're going to talk about on this slide. So right, and we chose to break away from them for the power supply services. And that means tracking our power supply, buying ahead our power, getting new power contracts. We don't work with MWIC on that any longer because we found them too expensive and they, we didn't feel like they were <coughs> taking care of our needs. So we've grouped up with other municipal electrics and we work with a firm called Energy New England that does a lot of those services for us. We're still connected with MWIC because we have power contracts with them. So we did deals with them years ago 
And so we're connected with MWEC through the deals that we own. However, we're not doing any new deals with MWEC. We haven't been in the last seven years. So the deals that we have are, of course, you're, you're getting the power wholesale because you're banding together with other yep. municipalities. That will still be the case? Correct. We still we have to pay them to manage those contracts. Right, but you're getting the power. Yep, we're getting power at a, from it. At a discounted rate. Oh, yeah, yep. Well, through that rate that was ever, yep, through those rates. And that was the difference between being a member and being a project participant. With Correct. As a pro yes, we're, we're so still a, a project member, participant with right. MWEC, but we're not a member of MWEC. Okay. So how are we doing on renewables as part of our, so, or so, maybe I'm so leading is, you into the, This okay. is the chart um, that shows where our power comes from in Danvers. Dave, before we want to jump into this, do Oh, yeah, yeah, we're on, yeah, right, we're oh, on line items, yeah. right. Excuse me. Yep. You're still back on the... Uh... I don't want to leave you out. Yeah. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, CR, you're right. Um, just a quick question. You, uh, I think in the report it says you have 37 miles of underground. Yep. Where are they located? Mostly in the subdivisions. All the new subdivisions have underground, and the, and the Liberty Tree Mall has a lot of underground. Okay. That's, but it's, it's all, and the industrial parks, some of them have it, but mostly the new subdivisions and Liberty Tree Mall. Those are the biggest pieces. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Bill? That's right. This chart. Do you think it was this chart? It's to me again. It. It's Sally brought up the it. comment about the Get lights tired. flooding. When I have observed oh. some of the panels of the boards, and they ask about lighting, it's directional down, so it doesn't, it's not, Oh, I forget the term they use. You're not halo. Halo. Well, I not not that so much. It's it's when they show a picture of the of the United States, it's all lit up. It's wasted energy. So when they put lighting in a, a new business, there's a cone, so to speak. So the lighting only goes in one direction, down to serve its purpose, not to flood the area with lighting. Her question, uh, are these new straight lights, can they put shades on them so that the lights only mm. go where they're needed, not in her bedroom windows, so to say? What well, she you? could put shades in her window. No. no. Is there such a thing as putting shades on the lights? So, or is so, it cost effective, I guess? Well, well. we, we got to remember that we, we only have fixtures on every other pole. Okay. So, and we do need to provide, as a town, a set level of light on the road for safety. So if we had lights that went straight down, like you'd see if a new shopping center went in and they put lights in every 15 feet that go straight, you know, straight luminaires down, we would need at least twice as many street lights. And, and we're not even sure if that, if that would be enough. So our street lights, they don't go straight down. They have a cone that goes out mm -hmm. in order to cover the area between the lights. So you don't have a light, then a dark spot, then a light. Okay, I guess I'm looking at something in between really down, really up, and you're saying you know, that's kind of what we have, That's hopefully that's what we have now is in, in the middle, uh, as uh, bright as it is, but it's... Adjusting the cone, so to speak, I guess, I don't know. Well, we looked at a lot I'm, of... After her comment, I just wanted if there's a better way of yep. doing what we have to do or want to do and doing what we'd like to do for some of the customers. So when we picked the fixture, we had... We looked at a lot of fixtures. We had at least 10 that were delivered to town. We installed, I think, six different fixtures and looked at how those cones and how it was received and, and did that. So we looked at many fixtures to pick the one that would light up the roads properly and create as little glare as possible. Okay. So we tried to do. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Any other questions on line items? Nope. Okay. My favorite slide. Mm -hmm. So this is our, um, our portfolio of where we're contracted to buy and how much power we get from various sources right now in Danvers. We all know the biggest piece of power still comes from our contracts with Seabrook and that the, they're looking to get that license extended to 2035 up in Seabrook. So all likelihood looks like we're hopeful to keep getting power for the next couple of decades from Seabrook. The price of the Seabrook power has come down as they paid off some of the debt. We saw a, a big debt payoff last year. We saw a little small one this year. So that's helping with the cost of the power from Seabrook. 
although Seabrook is not renewable, uh, we can look at as it's not produced by a carbon. You know, it's not by burning natural gas or, or oil, something like that. The other nuclear power is in the maroon at the bottom, Millstone. That's our other nuclear power plant. And that one's licensed through 2045. Where is that located? Connecticut. 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 So if we're kind of going clockwise, then we get to the, the, the pink, the green, and the blue. Oh, I've got a pointer here. So here, oh, look at this. I'll sit back. All right, so right there, we've got pink. Stony Brook, so that's a peak, so, so the pink right here is Stony Brook Intermediate. So intermediate means if power demand is getting higher, we o this is a little bit more expensive, we only use this in periods of high demand. We would, we would use that, we would use that plant. Is that down on Long Island? No, 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 it's, um, it's in Vermont, right? I believe it's up in Vermont. Oh, okay. Um, right next to it is Stony Brook Peaking Plant. They also, right here, we don't use it very often, because it's for only when we're really at the extreme levels of, of power and we need to use this. It's very expensive. And a lot of times when we go to use that, it's in the middle of winter, they don't have enough natural gas to run that plant. And they can only run it on oil so long. So it's, we have a contract with it, but you can see by the sliver, we don't use it very much. Right here, we have Nextera, Nextera Rise, which is primarily funded by natural gas. So it's a contract that we put out. It's a relatively short-term contract. You see it only goes through 2013, and that from natural gas. The next one is Nextera Bilateral. This contract is supplied by Nextera. What we do is we, we went out to bid. We put a, a bid out for this chunk of purple, this amount of power, and it's more complicated than that, but we, and we asked the companies to supply it. This was bid as non-carbon power which means it has to come from either nuclear or uh, renewable, so one of those sources. That's what this is right here. So we can't say it's renewable, but it's, it's non-carbon. Then right here, this is the plant, which is a hydro plant, the NIPA plant. Then next to that, we have Canna Mountain, which is wind. So now we're this, up here, all the colors, now we're getting into our true renewables. Canna Mountain is wind. Canon. Canon. C A N N. I think it's. Canton. Oh, Canton. What am I saying? I want to go skiing, I, thought, wow, I guess. I didn't, yeah. It's Canton. I'm sorry. It's Canton. Um, Brown Bear is hydro hydropower. Saddleback. That's another wind farm. Next is Classico. Classico is the solar panels which run Danvers Indoor Sports right here in town. Oh, great. Yellow is First Light. That's our newest one that we talked about in the budget. That's the newest hydro, uh, hydropower contract that we just did. And then this last one, right now, see, this is market. What we, what we just leave open and we buy off the spot market. And our policy is to keep our portfolio so that at all times we're buying less than 10% in the market. We want to have at least 90% at least of our power contracted for at all times. So right now you can see we don't have much in the market right now. Um, and that's primarily due to we just added the first light. We saw that, that was an opportunity that we wanted to take advantage of, so, and so we did. So we don't have much in the market right now. However, if you look over at the big green one, you see that dropping off with 2023, that, one's, that one we're gonna have to look to replace soon. So that's what we're working on right now is what's going to replace the green and the purple. And actually, Clinton staff, they have a meeting uh, with a number of other municipal electrics that next week to go look at other um, renewable sources that are out there, possible power contracts that we can get in on. So we're always looking for new contracts, things that we can do, um, and we try to balance those. When these fall off, we try to have something in place before it falls off. Basically, you have no coal. No what? No coal fired. Yeah, we don't have any coal. Yep, and there's, you know, the only oil is this peaking plant down here, and that's hardly gets used. Right, right. right, right. 
Is hydroelectric considered renewable? Yes, it is. Okay. Yep, those are those are dams on a river. How about the the corridor that's been discussed coming through Canada down through Maine and that, that's, that's controversial. That's yeah, well, it, you know. We're not holding our breath to see that yeah. get done. <laughs> so, you know, Vermont killed it, and now Maine is working their hardest to kill it. So, so that would open up. There's more hydropower up there. We just can't get it to us. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what the state was counting on. It's oh, yeah. There's, there's good renewable energy up there. We just can't get it. Okay. So the next slide, Clint put this one together, and this is showing uh, on the graphs you see these are our, our um, by type, the, in the colors, you see it starts at the bottom with the nuclear, the hydro, and then you get, and those, are, those are the non-carbon ones at the bottom in the green. And then we get into the yellow, the non-specified, which, which could come, that could come from uh, nuclear, it could come from a renewable, and then the straight natural gas up at the top. And then you see the oil, yeah, it's that black line. Oh, oh, geez. <laughs> Rodney, what I do? The end. Yeah, the end. <laughs> oh, wow, you really shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we moved the winter. Move the budget. Yeah. Yeah. CR gave me a wink. <laughs> <laughs> on the, on the um, solar up at the, if we ever got that done, what, how would that roughly fit in here? I mean, look at oh, the one at the oh, it, it, it's small. It'd be yeah, like the classical. Like the classical one. Yeah. Yep. Is classical is that like a, a single project? Is that part, is classical a large company or is that is that basically somebody that built the panels on top of it and sold it back to your service? Yeah. So they're the entire, on your. They're I'm asking, is that the entire business of classical? Is that no, 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 no. They in, inside the business. They've got the whole soccer fields and a gym. Right, but that's that. But that, it's that company. Like it's that, yeah, we, so, so we. Classico doesn't own a billion solar sites, nope, and that's nope. just one. Nope, that's, that's just one. Okay, that's just a local business yep. that struck a contract with you. To put yep, we negotiated a contract with them. Understood. Yep. And it's, it's a direct connect. Everything they produce goes right. And they're obligated under the contract <laughs> to provide us so much. If they, if they don't maintain the system or don't, there's penalties that kick in. Oh, and then there's a, a second one just going in up at Abiomed on Cherry Hill, really? in the Cherry Hill Industrial Park. So you go up there, they've got a solar array that we're just working on getting them online. Mm. David, Mike might have asked you, just asked the question, but if you went up to the uh, landfill yep. and you are able to put in solar, yep. have, you had a, have you thought about, oh, well, you probably have, but how many solar panels would you be looking at? putting in there and is it a big dent or is it just small? Like oh, it's still going to be, like we said, it's going to be a sliver on this like yeah, okay. Classico, but we're yeah. looking at, you know, six to seven acres of, of panels. panels. Really? And it still would only... Yeah, yeah it's only still, yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. Half yep. a percent, basically. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Are those better rates for you than kind of what you contracted out in the other stuff? Eh, uh, no, the, no. <laughs> No, it's, it's the, the solar is not our cheapest, most inexpensive power. I, I hate to say it, our natural gas power is our most inexpensive power. You know, we've got we've got natural gas power we're getting for three cents a kilowatt at times. It's or three, yeah. So I know, but we have to keep in mind that it's not all about the least oh. expensive dollar wise. No, absolutely not, and that's why we're so we're working with the state on the <laughs> regulations. So, and I, I, it's in my in my notes is so the the. Regulations are being promulgated now on we're going to have to do an annual report card and submit it to the state, DPU, on how much renewable we have. And they have goals set out. And so we're like, we're set for, we're looking very good for the, you know, the next decade and a little further than that. But when you go out, get out 30 years from now, they're looking at 80% renewable as a goal for a utility like Danvers. So we're working that through with them right now and, and see what happens. But... But yeah, so it's it's re it's coming, and that's what, and that's why we take advantage of these, even though it's not our most inex inexpensive power. It's the right thing to do. There you go. Agreed. Any other questions? No. I'd like to move the electric budget. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank Great. you. Great. It was very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. I think that's it.
Anything else for us, Mr. Town Manager? No, we, um, we're finalizing the warrant this evening. Uh, we're going to send it out to the selectmen with their packets tomorrow, and it should be online by Monday. They meet on uh, Tuesday and yours will be Wednesday? How? Selectmen meet Tuesday and Wednesday? The selectmen will be reviewing the warrant on Tuesday and Wednesday next week, and then we'll be reviewing it the following week. So the 16th and the 17th. Um, give us a notion of how voluminous. It'll be a two-hour town meeting if we stretch it out. Okay. It's a pretty straightforward Great. warrant. Okay. You're talking about town meeting? Oh. Well, the warrant. More I than, meant how, how many warrants? More than articles 40 articles, but at? most of them are repeat customers. There aren't too many odd, oddball. Uh, no items. citizen stuff? We no, we had no citizen petitions. Um, and we, you know, we will be, we will, we are planning a special town meeting for the fall for the downtown zoning planning department. Thinks they'll be ready um, by the fall to, to circle back and and, and uh, pursue another uh, town meeting approval for that. So there may be some other housekeeping stuff that we have for that. But, well, but the proposed date for that fall town meeting, did you? With the, uh, we don't have a date in, in mind. November. Yet. Probably November. Yeah. So no votes on the financing for the school yet. No. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Good week. Appreciate it. Well done, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Yeah, actually, the, <laughs> the others are definitely.